Okay, so I've got some good people here with me. I've got uh, Jack, Bryn, Detroyer, Doorman, Malpass, and Venus. Uh, we're going to watch over some of Detroyer's debate with Jay Dyer. We're doing it on Watch Together so people can just pause and comment whenever they want. Uh, we'll probably not get through the whole thing. It's pretty long. But uh, with that said, I'm just going to switch over scene and uh, we'll get into it. Prior, because they were muted when they came in. All right. Um... <laughs> up everyone so today we're going to be doing a de or tonight we're going to be doing a debate between jay dyer and detroyer on whether or not god exists i appreciate everyone coming and obviously like jay and detroyer thanks for coming on we don't have a lot of these anymore um so i guess i'll start if uh jay wants to just give a short introduction for people who might not know who you are like what you do what you believe you know what you're about stuff like that yes uh I do jaysanalysis.com. I'm a student of philosophy and theology. Cover a lot of movies, geopolitics. Do a lot of uh, goofy, comedic type of stuff as well. And I do a lot of debates. Um, so I come from a uh, Orthodox Christian perspective. I've been through uh, a few different religious views. I was raised uh, Protestant, got into Roman Catholicism, and then uh, studied a lot of Platonism and Neoplatonism and then got into orthodoxy in my uh, 30s. So um, I'm here to argue in favor of the existence of the triune God, uh, the validity and coherence of the presuppositional argument, um, and the coherence of the Christian worldview. I think it's the only worldview that really gives a grounding for uh, the what we could call a worldview. So that's my position. All right, and Detroit, if you could just do the same, just give a short little introduction on what you're about and what you're going to be defending or uh, arguing for tonight. Sure. Um, I'll just start by saying briefly, uh, thanks for hosting this discussion, and thanks, Jay, for taking it part. Um, I'll just say briefly that uh, I have a bachelor's in philosophy, as far as relevant here, and I like engaging with uh, others on philosophical issues and, and so forth. Um, and in terms of what my views are, um, uh, religiously, I consider myself agnostic on the existence of God. Um, in this discussion, I'll be um, taking a sort of opposition stance to his uh, this sort of transcendental or, or uh, presuppositionalist approach to uh, belief in God. Um, I'm sorry, you cut beyond off. that. You, you say you're going to critique the view. Is that what you said? I'm sorry. You cut yeah, I, it's my position that, um, at least as far as I can tell, that that the view does not. Um, convincingly demonstrate uh, okay. the, the existence of the Christian God or, or of a God in general. Sorry, let me know if my audio is You're good. Um, shit, because it was it was me. I was distracted. It wasn't you. I had to yeah. Sounds good. Something. Uh, so Jay, if you could lay out just very quickly for a lot of people who don't know what the transcendental argument for God is, just um, sorry, I'm just reading your message, Alex. Are you getting the audio here? Uh, you're muted in Discord. You hear me now? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Still shows the mute, your... mute symbol, though. Very, well, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I unmuted in Watch Together. Oh, it's better right. if you can unmute in Discord. <laughs> okay, right, that's all I needed to know. All good. Yeah. Uh, okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, as, you know, as much detail as you want. Right. I would state it that um, if we look at anything that pertains to what we could call a worldview, so anything in the domain of ethics, metaphysics, or epistemology, any of the branches or any area of life, whether it's uh, something like objective ethics or whether it's something like um, uh, abstract entities, mathematical entities, uh, logic itself, meta-logic, meta-ethic, um, any of these kinds of topics or things that when we try to make sense of them and to see if they are coherent and to give a grounding for them, we are oftentimes led to, I would argue, uh, transcendental preconditions. In, in other words, that there are preconditions that uh, are necessary or must be the case for any of the things that I listed to be possible. So we're saying that they are preconditions of possibility at all. 
and then my uh, addendum to that is that when I look at all the various transcendental categories or presuppositions, uh, and there are, granted, there are different types of transcendental arguments. People make different uh, types of arguments. I'm making a very specific one. I'm going to say that when I list or look at all these different transcendental categories, such as uh, the existence of an external world, such as the existence of a self that is coherent and retains uh, memories and, and impressions and so forth over time, um, the uh, 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 space-time uh, perception of an external world, um, for sentences and, and propositions. So can I just jump to this, yeah. be this beginning bit, right? Like, I <clears throat> I kind of don't really get what um, he's talking about. <laughs> I mean, I'm familiar with the words that he's using, <laughs> but um, the combination of them in this particular context is very strange to me. I, I just don't really understand. So he's, you know, there's this idea of, like, a transcendental argument or whatever, right? And the word transcendental sounds, you know, important and deep and blah, blah, blah. But basically, it's just about, like, um, showing something being necessary for something else. I mean, basically, that's basically all it is, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so it's not like there are transcendental categories or something. I mean, that to me, that just sounds like bullshit, right? Right from the beginning. And you could, anything could be priest. So, like, if I say... Um, the knave stole all the tarts, right? It's one of the examples in the literature. Then that presupposes that there's a knave, right? I mean, there's nothing transcendental and spooky or whatever about that. It's just that, you know, one, it's presupposed by the sentence. Um, so anything can be presupposed by anything in principle, right? There's nothing, there's not like only things like the self or whatever. Like if he's trying to carve out a special category of things, it's not just because they're the things that have presuppositions or, or whatever, or they're the things that are presupposed by something. So I just don't know what that category of things is that he's saying worldviews ha have these ingredients. He just lists, without any rhyme or reason, it seems to me, some things from philosophy, ethics, meta-ethics, metaphysics, whatever. But there's no reason, like, I don't know what's tying those that choice together. And for some reason, he didn't say politics, right? Like, why not? What's wrong with that? Or sociology or history or something but metaphysics and meta ethics are both in there so like what is it apart from just being philosophical concepts that yeah he you know, just throws in through? like he just throws in like causation <laughs> like reflection yeah. abstract and like random seeming seemingly random things are different areas of philosophy mm -hmm. and just calls them transcendental like i was i was fine just for the purpose of the, like the debate calling them quote unquote transcendentals assuming that is just just a label to refer to the category of things he was talking about that that necessitate right. god um but yeah it is a weird way to talk about things and it's somewhat arbitrary the things he chooses yeah that's right it's just just his list just jay's list of things that he wants to talk about that he likes to talk about basically there's nothing else to it than that um, or at least if there is, he doesn't say anything about what, about why those things are chosen. You know, they all have something in common and that thing is X and that's why we're talking about them. He doesn't say anything like that. So we just left looking at a list, not knowing why we're talking about those things in particular. But he tells you that everybody's got a worldview and they all provide answers to these big questions. Now, I'm already like, no, that's, that's also bullshit, right? Like, everyone's got a worldview in a way, right? It depends what you mean by worldview. Like... I believe things about the world, I guess. If that's all it me means to be a worldview, then obviously everybody has them. But not everyone has a view on meta-ethics, for instance. Right? Like my gran, she doesn't even know what it means. So obviously she doesn't have a worldview that has um, answers to all of these deep me metaphysical questions that Jay decided that we should all have an answer to. So if, if you know, there's a kind of there's a kind of choice. It's either worldview is something kind of trivial, it just means everybody's the things they believe, or it means something like answers to Jay's list of profound questions. Right? If it's the former, then everybody has one, but they don't necessarily answer all the things that Jay thinks we need to. If it's just providing a list of answers to that list of questions, then not everybody has one of those, right? So he's trying to pretend, or it seems to me he's fudging between two senses of worldview, one where everybody has it, and one which is like a sort of specialist philosophical project or whatever that not everybody has um and he's he never really 
clearly distinguishes between those things. Anyway, well, when we, just one point. As we'll get to later, but when he starts talking about starting points, he clearly is invoking the latter, the latter sort, right? And where you you have your worldview includes uh, at the start, like answers to these important questions, which, as you're right, like many people, even including well-informed people about these topics, don't have answers to, um, and in some cases may not even have thought about. It. So, but anyway. Yeah, and I mean, it's fine if it's the if it's the latter concept. So it's this big philosophical project that someone might undertake to find out the answers to all of those questions. Then fine, somebody might have them, but it's no, it's not an intellectual like. It doesn't in, invalidate you from participating in a debate or something if you don't have answers to all of those questions, right? Like lacking one of those, a grand philosophical perspective on all of those things doesn't invalidate you from doing anything, right? It should be, like, if that's the concept in mind, then it's by no means mandatory that you have that. Um, and I know lots of, like, professional actual philosophers who who know nothing like that in mind, nothing systematic and, you know, an answer to every one of those questions. They just approach things pragmatically, you know, as things come, we'll see what they think and they change their mind and stuff. So, like, I mean, it doesn't even seem like it's, required to be a professional philosopher so I, I don't really know who's supposed to have it's an energy my suspicion is that it's just a kind of fantasy about one way of looking at these things which basically is just what you would think everyone else is like if you were a religious fundamentalist who had a <laughs> ready-made cookie cutter answer to all of those questions because that's what your creed is right it's like we believe as an orthodox whatever that you know that whatever divine conceptualism is true and you know the soul exists and blah 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 but if you're not in a creed or like a an organized group of people who all believe the same thing you don't necessarily think like that you might just you know not know what you think about some of those questions it just seems to me that there's this kind of um it's like a presupposition of presuppositionalism that everybody has worldviews in the same way and that they're all basically just different types of religious fundamentalism yeah, everyone has their different like package system or something. Yeah, it's right, just right. Like set yeah, yeah. Or well, the other thing to, th to think about. Sorry, I'll shut up in a second. The other thing to think about that. Is, well, what would you think if you took a couple of philosophy classes, right? Well, you'd have been introduced to some big ideas and the basic positions you might take on them. And if you never really spent much more time doing it than than that one kind of one semester course or something. You might think that's what it is. It's this game where everybody like picks an identity by going, oh, I'm a determinist and a Platonist and a whatever, and just like yes. picking these categories and that that's you, then you haven't you've worked out what what team you're on or something. When in actual fact it's not really like that, you know. It's much, much more complicated and subtle and you know. So that's kind of sophomoric angle on this too, it seems to me. Anyway, I'll shut up. We can press play now if you want. I saw Doorman and Venus try to get a word in. Do you guys care, or you want to keep going? Okay, I'm going to keep Positions playing. and so forth. We use logic, etc. Grounding those, we need, I would argue, transcendental categories. And then when I have all these transcendental categories in sort of a bundle, grounding those, we need a personal God, and namely the Trinity that is found in Orthodox Christianity, because that uh, argument, that theism is unique. So there's not another type of theism that can ground, for example, the problem of the one and the many, or they can ground the uh, distinction between creator and cre creature, and yet at the same time, through the divine energies, have a relationship within, imminent in the created order, and yet at the same time, not identical to it. Uh, it's the divine mind, for example, that grounds immaterial logical objects like numbers or laws of logic. And so therefore, I'm arguing for a form of divine conceptualism. I'm not arguing for Plato's divine conceptualism, but a form of it which I would just say is the transcendental argument. So that is my version of the argument. Gotta notice how Jay's argument just never has like premises and conclusion. Although to, to your credit, Troy, you get something out of him eventually that's a bit more clear. Yeah. A total side note here, but I watched his debate with Tom jump. I think Tom triggered him to a level that was like, I, I didn't know it was possible actually, but he ended up saying that he accepts circular arguments. Um, so he's one of those kind of presuppositionalists. He believes in this virtuous versus vicious circularity distinction. 
but that's yeah. getting a little. But then that was, which is uh, ironically a fallacy. But anyways, that's kind of <laughs> not a logical fallacy. But <laughs> 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 all right, and also to try just real quick, uh, while Jay was talking, you had some typing. Maybe if you could turn on push to talk. Yeah. Uh, uh, next time. Uh, I was going to ask. I was going to ask if that was audible because I, I take. I'll turn push to talk on. All right, so I think oh, that was good. You could start. I, I think. Uh, Maybe if I state what I think the argument is you're trying to make and see if you can correct me or let me know if this is more or less correct. Um, so you're supposing that there are these truths about the world of, say, causation, induction, sure. uh, uh, um, identity over time, the existence of the external world. Right. Um, those things have... Uh, necessary preconditions. There's other things which have to be the case in order for those things to be true. And right. at least one of those things is um, the Christian God or the Orthodox Christian God. Well, I'm, I'm not saying at least one of those things. I'm but saying the only thing, perhaps. Yeah. Right. I'm saying that the only thing that but when we look at all of the uh, Christian worldview, so it's an argument particularly for not just the existence of God, but also by extension, the rest of the Christian revelation and worldview that that world and that deity makes sense of all of those things, the coherence of the transcendental categories, etc. cetera, uh, and that worldview alone. And so other worldviews like Muslim, uh, Islam or something like that, those are going to be deviations, we would argue, from our worldview. But uh, simply put, yes, that, that's kind of what I'm saying. All right. So before, I assume we'll get to the individual things at some point. But before we get to that, um, it's not quite clear to me how you get from these things required to have these necessary, some necessary precondition, which let's just suppose for now. How do you get from that to the necessary precondition is the Orthodox Christian God? And it must be that. Right, because again, it requires looking at uh, multiple transcendental categories and how they interrelate with one another. For example, uh, the existence of the external world presupposes a self that is experiencing the external world. Now, theoretically, one could say, well, I just deny an external world, or I deny the self. Uh, and I would reply by saying, at any point that you deny what, what I would call preconditions, you're immediately put in a position to destroy the possibility of knowledge at all. So if there's no self, then you can't argue your position. You're okay, so... What is this? Like, so I can <laughs> So if he, so he's saying, like, if you were to deny something like the existence of the self, I guess, I think that's what he was, or the existence of the external world or something. And he says, well, the problem with that would be that you would be to denying the possibility of knowledge, right? But, you know, what about, hold, you know, hold on a minute. What about like skepticism? Like, hello, skepticism alert kind of thing. Like, there's this idea that maybe knowledge is impossible right because of like skepticism you know maybe when we take ourselves to know things which you don't know them now jay's reply just seems to be oh but that destroys the possibility of knowledge that so game over right like no that's the point of skepticism like maybe knowledge is impossible like how do you know it isn't like what what what's going on with knowledge or whatever you can't just say the problem with that skepticism is it like threatens the possibility of knowledge like too bad, buddy. That might be a thing. <laughs> like, but, it's, I, mean, I don't know. It's, just... it's also just a complete non-answer. I mean, he's, what, what does this have to do with the question I asked? Well, this is also a, a thing about how Jay talks, right? Like he kind of goes off on random tangents, and mm. you have to really force him onto like, look, I want an answer to this specific thing, or I want you to deliver an argument in premise conclusion form. You have to like force him onto that pathway and the worst part is that if you succeed at forcing him onto the pathway and you kind of get him in a corner eventually he doesn't stay there and he starts trying to like burst out in all these crazy directions like you know you're presupposing this you justify your worldview you're like wait but like mm -hmm. my worldview is fucking irrelevant right now what are you talking about right well I, i've decided to defend jay dyer um <laughs> Well, largely because it's, I think it would be boring otherwise. Uh, there's a few of the things he said I can't really defend. I was going to try to say that he was just misunderstanding Kant uh, when he's talking about the transcendental categories, but I decided to not even go down that route. But on the skepticism note, I just take what he's saying to be something like um, any argument 
that would entail some kind of global skepticism, or any view, I should say, that entails a kind of global skepticism is just a non-starter. The same way that I might give you an argument that, well, if you hold X and Y position, it entails Z. Say Z is uh, some insane view, like global skepticism, necessitarianism, trivialism. And the point is that if you take that kind of view, then if it entails this, then it's just a non-starter. So obviously you might say, well, what, like, what's the argument for thinking global skepticism is you know, this and this? But I'm, I'm just going to take it that uh, on his, he believes that no one's actually a global skeptic or something like that. Yeah, something like that would be useful. Like if he said, um, like, well, I just d don't want to engage with someone who ends up defending global skepticism or trivialism or whatever, right? Like, I just, I just can't be bothered with that type of thing or whatever. I'm fine. But like, or, or if he said, I don't, you know, I just don't think anyone actually believes those things or something like fine. But like, he just seems, he just points at it. Like that would entail the impossibility of knowledge. Like, okay. What are you saying about that? Like, am I supposed to just know that that, that you've got on a view that you don't like that and it's wrong or something like, I don't know. It just seems like it's a really weird stance to take without any context to it. You know, I'm just supposed to know that him pointing and sort of going, ah, bad thing, look at that, don't, I don't like it, that that's enough to refute a worldview or something. <laughs> like, it just is so messy. Like, what the hell is going on? I don't know. Yeah, I should, I should be clear that I'm not saying this is what he actually believes. I'm just trying to take the most, like, strongest... Uh, sure, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He could... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true, right? Because he thinks, based on some of the things he says later in the debate, like, he would say that if you're a, a sort of global skeptic, then you can't... You don't really have anything to bring to the debate then, right? So it's not really well uh, as far as he's concerned, that is. <laughs> because he changed it moved the goalposts again at that point. I mean we'll come to that, but like he he, he said, Well um well we'll we'll, we'll come to it, but he, yeah, he basically yeah, yeah. says, you know, this is a debate, so the rules are different for me. I can <laughs> I'm allowed to rule you offside because even though you're not, then I'm just saying saying there's a context in play that means you're offside. That's basically all that was going on there. But let's come to that. Which is a Molyneux-esque move, actually. It is, yeah. yeah it's true. Also, to be fair, right. Jay, he actually has tried to present a syllogism before. Brain, you're super quiet. Can you somehow boost your volume? I have you at 200, and I can barely hear you. Is it just me? Presumably saying. no one can tell. Yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> well, Bryn's fixing his audio. Venus, you're trying to say something, too? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think... I don't know if this is too relevant, but I think he said that the existence of the external world entails that there's a self. I, I, I don't. I didn't understand like how he got. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I heard if, that one. If ex external world is, is meant as like relation to something to which is external, <laughs> then I guess it's the self you're talking about. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, is he gesturing at like the unity of a perception or whatever the Kantian? Thing about how you can deduce the existence of the self from the continuity of experience over time. I mean, I don't know. It's certainly not just the well, the ex external world exists, therefore I exist. That's obviously a terrible argument. Um. Right. <laughs> well, I thought the only point he was making here was that these various transcendentals, as he calls them, are like related in, in, in certain ways, but I, and interdependent, whatever. I, I, I mean, but well, so what? <laughs> Before we get crack on, can I just quickly lay out the Barry Stroud objection to transcendental sure, arguments? Sure, sure. Because it's super relevant in this. Like, so the idea is that you have a distinction between like modest transcendental arguments and ambitious transcendental arguments, and it's basically a kind of metaphysical epistemic distinction, right? So, on a modest transcendental argument, it would be something. Like, Jay's version would be something like this. Um, unless you believe in Christian orthodoxy or whatever, uh, then you can't have, I guess, coherent experience in the widest sense, like a worldview that answers all of these questions and whatnot. Um, and, and so then the thought would be, uh, or and okay, so to distinguish it then, the, the ambitious one wouldn't be unless you believe in Christian orthodoxy, but unless Christian orthodoxy is true, then you couldn't have a coherent worldview or whatever, right? So one of them's modest it's just about stating what's required is me having a certain belief and in the ambitious one what's required is something actually being true right and you know on 
if he says, look, unless you believe, it seems a lot of the time it's it's modest, right? Like, unless you have the Christian God as part of the worldview, the, of a belief that you hold, then you wouldn't be able to explain why things like numbers and induction and blah, 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 right? My, my belief in God sort of coheres all of these ideas together or something. Um, and the basic issue with that is that, like, it might be that you have to believe a false thing in order to have a coherent worldview, right? And it just doesn't follow logically that even if you have to believe something in order to have answers to all these big questions, that that entails that the thing that, you know, that you believe in is actually true, right? It doesn't. You, it might be, for instance, that, you know, you can imagine somebody um, having to believe that they're a good person in order to get out of bed and carry on with their life or something. Um, and, and entertain that that belief, but it'd be false because they're absolute asshole, right? And they're constantly um, mean to people or whatever. But it might be that they have to think that they're a good person in order to do whatever. So it, you can see how a false belief could be, in some sense, sort of necessary for somebody to have a coherent or productive outlook or whatever. And it might just be that I mean, maybe it's true that you have to believe in Christian orthodoxy in order to have all of these big questions satisfactorily answered but even if it was right i don't think that's a, in any sense tr true but even if it was true that doesn't mean that god exists does it it just means that some belief is required for you to have coherent answers to something and then if you take the ambitious um version of the transcendental argument you're just saying unless god existed there there wouldn't be numbers or induction or whatever and then it's just dependence we're just talking about one thing's existence depending on something else's and we're just talking about the contingency argument right like yeah. there isn't it's not actually any different to the transcendental argument then so that's the basic problem is like if it's modest it doesn't actually establish anything outside of your own head and if it's ambitious it's not actually a different argument from the contingency argument but that's how i see the the barry stroud thing and I, I think that Jay slips and slides between modest and ambitious without knowing the difference, with, right? And it ma massively muddies the waters. And so it's, I think it's interesting and helpful to see that and, and sort of point it out when it's happening. Like, now he's being ambitious, now he's being modest, and he's not yeah. recognizing so, it. So I appreciate the distinction. Like, in one case, you're establishing that some belief in P is necessary for you to like have a coherent worldview or for whatever thing yeah. and in the other case you're actually establishing that p is necessary for you yeah. to have the coherent worldview or whatever the thing is yeah so and of course it's like it's funny because even the modest version doesn't go through and it's also not clear when he's using which and i agree it's useful to point that out but one thing this might just be my newbery with um the philosophy of religion but the contingency argument is what exactly because you said if it's the strong version, if it's uh, if it's not modest, if it's strong, then it's the same as the contingency argument. And yeah, well, how, then, what is that argument? But then you're just saying something like, look, everything that's contingent, all the contingent things in the world, like my experience of whatever, um, has to come from somewhere, right? And it might be that the immediate cause of whatever contingent thing we're looking at is some other contingent thing. But the contingency argument is going to like lay out... Um, reasons for you to think that that chain of contingent dependencies couldn't go on forever and at some point it bottoms out with something necessary and that thing's God, right? So then if that's all he's saying, you know, in order to have A, you've got to have B first, in order to have B, you've got to have C first and right at the end of that chain, you've got this self-sustaining necessary existent thing, then fine, but we're just talking about um, the con that's the argument from contingency, right? Um, gotcha. And it's, so, but like if the the thing to keep in mind is like once you are acknowledged that it's an ambitious argument you're not talking about even if the even if the thing you start off talking about is a coherent experience what you're doing is like saying that that thing's existence depends on something else's existence right like ultimately he's going to say i wouldn't have any experience at all even an incoherent experience unless god existed right because god made everything and keeps it in existence and that's why everything is here and that's just the contingency argument but so when you make it metaphysical and ambitious and you're, you're not really talking about worldviews anymore you're just talking about why does something exist and you end up saying because a necessary thing made it 
then that's the <laughs> that's the contingency. I should just like clear away all the bullshit jargon that goes on. If it's not ambitious, it's just that argument instead. Wait, do, right. Okay. Do you think Sorry, he os- Oh no, I'm just gonna ask. Do you think he oscillates between giving a um, contingency argument and giving a because I I took him so far to just be giving the mildest version because he's talking about the possibility of knowledge. And I mean, transcendental means like a precondition for knowledge, a precondition for experience. So I'm just assuming that he's saying that unless you believe in the Christian God or whatever he's arguing for, the Eastern Orthodox Christian God, then you can't have knowledge. Yeah, but then it's, this is an argument that's supposed to have as its conclusion, not that he ever really says anything in premise conclusion form, but the conclusion is supposed to be God exists. Right? The conclusion isn't supposed to be, therefore, I believe in God. I mean, right. so that's why it has to oscillate between... It starts off in... Basically, it's much easier to motivate a modest transcendental argument, but that doesn't really get you anything that's worth getting. So what you have to do is sort of sleight of hand change at the last minute to be talking about an ambitious argument, right? But but make it seem like all you've done is defend the premises of a modest argument. So you're getting something that you haven't paid for in argumentative terms. So that's what I think is going on, basically. Yeah, it's yeah let's see if we can... Sorry, God. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, let's see if we can be sensitive to it and, and notice if there's oscillation happening. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think one thing to note is he's attempted to give a syllogism before. Over a year ago in his debate with Alex, he actually provided a syllogism that I put in the chat there where he does use um, like terms like necessitation. Um but of course there's a lot of other structural issues with the argument presented like the first premise is all philosophical systems or worldviews have fundamental assumptions that relate to metaphysics epistemology and ethics premise two is when we examine these presuppositions that make up those three branches of philosophy we encounter a host of things that are assumed and then he lists some examples like Kant, uh, Kant's categories abstract conceptual entities etc that seems to be necessary for the possibility of knowledge or discourse or ethics and then the conclusion is supposed to be from just those two premises that the way to give a meta level justification an explanation for the coherence of those things is the existence of god in the orthodox view the sort of like just getting besides the fact that it's not even a valid argument the right. problem is seems to be that even just the latter sort of part there of premise two almost has an oscillation, but he's trying to invoke these kinds of um, much firmer concepts like necessitation there. Uh, and so maybe it speaks a lot to what Alex was just saying, where either he's oscillating or he's trying to bake in assumptions that he can't quite do. You know, speaking of Jay giving formal arguments, I've actually seen him try a few times. So there's the one time in his debate with Stefan Molyneux where he oh, cracked out... One. Yeah. yeah, it looked like some grotesque, like, you know, hell baby from, like, a modal ontological argument and, like, presuppositionalism. And we were trying it in different modal logics, and, it, like, it went through in some and not others, and it wasn't clear if both of the last statements are conclusions, because it was, like, a mess. And then I've seen him do it recently also in his discussion with Tom Jump. He now has something that's a bit more clear. It's still not valid, but, like, the idea is just some little, like, kind of modus ponens, something like, you know, if we have knowledge, God exists. We have knowledge, therefore God exists, or something roughly like that. I'll, uh, I'll keep playing. You're not even yeah, arguing. Can... You're, you're, there's no self... Got... Sorry, Venus. Oh, no, I was just going to say that um, there are ways... It doesn't have to, like, oscillate. There are ways to make the modest one give him the desired conclusion depending on what theory of truth and also depending on if he's like adhering to some kind of a verificationist principle or not but I mean he didn't clarify that so that just I'm just saying there are like ways to make the modest one give the type of conclusion that he wants to establish it would change the discussion quite a lot if he was right to do to, to make those types of moves you know but I don't, I don't think he's read Stroud, so I don't think he knows that this even happened. <laughs> so, you're not making an argument. <laughs> so I'm saying that, um, you know, 
that an external world, for example, presupposes a self. Uh, there are assumptions that are necessary for um, perceiving things in an external world. For example, we perceive things from beginning to middle to end in a um, four-dimensional spatio-temporal uh, mm -hmm. external world. Uh, that's another transcendental precondition. It happens within time. You know, I mentioned beginning, middle, end. That that uh, is related right. to the notion of time. I, I'm not a Kantian, but I think Kant is correct that things like space and time could be considered transcendentally necessary categories, at least as far as we know how to. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, causation, teleology. I would say all of those things are valid uh, examples, and I'm I'm extending the argument saying that I think they also interrelate. It doesn't really make sense to talk about causation without some notion of the external world. I mean, you could think that the external world is all mental or something like that, but there's still a causal relation that's going on. Uh, you could think that the external world is, I don't believe this, but I'm just saying that people could come up with all types of conceivable, you know, well, what if I believe in teleology and causation, but I think the whole external world is just a mental phenomena. Okay, but you're still admitting the, the principle that there are, uh, you know, forces that are that are involved in causation. There is some notion of purpose that's out there uh, however you conceive of it. Um, I'm just saying that uh, I do believe that they necessitate and they interrelate with one another. And they presuppose, I, I, I would even go a little bit further and say, I think they presuppose a specific type of world, namely the world that we experience, right? The commonly experienced external world that we are aware of. That world is the one that I'm arguing for. And, it, and it's only really explained in the context of the, of the Christian paradigm as a whole. Yeah, so I think my question was how you get to that last step, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm willing to grant, at least for this part of the discussion, right, that all of these things are real. Like, we have to suppose that these things are real at least, right? Um, the self, the external world, whatever. How do you get from that, that these things are real, and perhaps even that they're interrelated in some important way? How do you get from that to, well, the necessary precondition for them, either individually or collectively, is the Orthodox Christian God? Right. That's why I included the aspect of divine conceptualism, that when I speak of grounding things or giving an account for things, um, I'm grounding them in an omniscient, eternal, divine mind that is able to connect and interrelate all of these different things. For example, I, I, if, unless there is an external world, and for example, as you know from you know, classic problems in the history of philosophy, if I begin with the human mind, um, I can never really prove that there is an external world if my starting point is autonomous human reasoning. So I kind of have to just assume that there is an external world. And there's, you know, four or five other uh, key things that I could, I could list from the history of any um, critique of empiricism, you know, like the myth of the given, uh, the uh, problem of induction, the external world, uh, the existence of abstract objects. Those are, are uh, typical problems in any empiricist type of worldview. And most of the time, 95% of the time, I'm arguing against somebody who's, who's got an empiricist presupposition. So I would say that if you are an empiricist and your presupposition is that there is no external or that, 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 uh, that those issues are just assumed, then I would say, okay, they're assumed, but how do you ground something like numbers? How do you ground something like logic? Because you can't ground it. Uh, or give a justification for it just by saying that, the, that these types of things are equated to uh, matter or material forces or energy or energy or motion, uh, matter in flux, basically. Be okay, so just, sorry, to, it's going to be really difficult not to keep pausing this, but what's really bizarre about it is, like, it's a really... straightforward question. <laughs> yeah, but, like, he's really fond of bringing quine two dogmas of empiricism oh, yeah. whenever he's like complaining about people they don't know what it is blah 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 and it's like i mean just read it like read the fucking paper quine's obviously an empiricist right and quine is explaining explicitly in that paper right how an empiricist epistemology would work and then he's also a fucking platonist like hello like did, i don't know it's just is it too much to ask that he would just read some of the things that he talks about a lot like and and then just sort of like saying well there's it's no there's no way an empiricist could justify uh, the existence of abstract objects apart from quine the mo world's most famous empiricist who he talks about all the time like it's just it's frustrating like mm, i don't know i don't have much else to say about it you know 
Tom actually brought him up on your point about Quine, or at least tried to in his uh, in his recent debate, and uh, yeah, it turned into a it turned into quite a shit show. Um, yeah, he was accusing him of not understanding uh, the two dogmas. Um, well, that's right. But yeah, also to- total total side point. Don't don't worry about pausing it. It's better that we have a good like thorough you know time with whatever we go through than that we actually get through the whole thing. It's fucking long. I highly doubt we'll get through the whole thing. Because yeah, well, we're certainly the, not. The, my the case. <laughs> it's like a Zeno paradox thing, isn't it? Because it's going to get longer and longer and longer. Yeah, I mean, seconds, we'll, so. we'll aim for getting through, you know, like seven minutes or so. It should be okay. <laughs> Real invariant abstract objects is that they don't change. They're not subject to flux, right? So that would apply to numbers, abstract objects, concepts, uh, logical laws, any of these types of things. They don't evolve. They don't, uh, you know, change with the way that uh, matter uh, evolves or changes. So therefore, where are they and how are they grounded? So again, this is like it's an, empiricism <laughs> is an epistemological uh, thing, right? It's like it's it's a saying that the way that you access knowledge is grounded in ultimately in right. experiences, right? We're not talking about just like ontology or something. Like yeah, are, exactly. Right? So empiricism is, has to answer that, like <laughs> yeah, or that if you're an empiricist, you're automatically a materialist. Like, that's just right. so straightforwardly not true. And, like, it's so frustrating because, again, I just want to be like the poster boy empiricist, Quine, was a Platonist. Like, he's not a materialist. Like, wh- who is it even that he's thinking about? It's just a straw man. I mean, okay, so he's got this, like, critique against a, an invented position that you don't hold, that no one that I can think of actually holds. So, like, so what? Like, why are we even talking about it? It's just, it's just. I don't know. I just it's take just him weird. to be. I well, I'm, I'm gonna uh, defend him again because it's yeah. fun. Uh, <laughs> but I just take him to be saying two things. On Quine's point, again, I'm putting words in his mouth completely. He might not agree, but I'm gonna say that if you asked him, well, hold on. I mean, Quine um, was clearly an empiricist. Uh, what does the two dogmas have to do with this? Um, he might say something. Well, the only way Quine made sense of it was given his given his views on um, epistemology, right, his whole naturalizing epistemology, what he took it to be, was too deflationary. And so that view is false, because I, 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 I assume he's not some kind of, like, uh, he doesn't hold to some sort of natural epistemology. And I, I don't know, is he a holist in general? I have no clue. Um, but he might just say, look what happened to Quine holding or that view. The only way you can make sense of it is what he did. But I think on the other point, I think what he's just saying is, or what he in my mind is saying is that uh, he takes that if you're an empiricist, there's going to be some sort of issue. If you take abstracted to be, obviously, uh, they don't intercausal relations, then, you know, there's the famous objection of, well, how do you know about them? So I just take him to be saying something like that. Um, Of course, you're 100% right that you can be an empiricist. Being an empiricist does not entail anti-realism or abstracted. No one, well, no one, I, I, I don't think there's a really good argument for that. Um, but maybe you just misspoke. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's the most charitable interpretation of Jay Dyer you can give. He's, he's just constantly misspeaking every other word. He's trying to dumb it down for Detroit. That, that's, that yeah, but that. he didn't dumb it down <laughs> far enough. That's also, the myth of the given was really weird, because I, I know what the myth of the given might be taken to be as an argument uh, against, like, foundationalist views, um, uh, but I, I don't, I don't see how just being an empiricist has this issue. Um, if you're, especially if you're not a foundationalist, I don't, I don't get it. But so anyway, that's specifically talking about like the type of, like when he says empiricism, he's talking about like logical positivism or something. Um, where they took like all propositions ultimately derived from sense data or something like that. Maybe that's what he had in mind. Yeah, but you can agree with that and not and not have a problem with um, like the myth of the given, right? Like if I'm if I'm a kind of coherentist, I, I don't really see the issue. Right. It's not like you can't be an empiricist and coherentist, yeah. But anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm I don't want to speak ill of my boy. Too late. 
And so ultimately any empiricist position ends up in nominalism. And so the only other option really is a form of universalism <laughs> to believe in yeah, the existence of universals or to believe in <laughs> um, some way to ground them in an external beyond the, the, in, the, in, the finite human mind. Really the only other option that's left is some form of divine conceptualism. So wait, is your so your way to get to um, the orthodox Christian God is to say, at least with regards to um, abstracta, is that well these things are real. We're, we're realists about these things, and the only way to be realist about them is is to say that they're grounded in um, yes or a, a divine mind. They're, right. they're conceptual. So why would we suppose that? I mean, how how do you how do you demonstrate that? The two steps, right? The first, I mean, ignore the step. Just for the sake of argument, we can I suppose that we're realists about these things. I tend not to be. I, I lean nominalist, but we suppose we can suppose that we're realists. And the, the question I'm asking is, how do you demonstrate that the only coherent way to be a realist is to be a divine conceptualist about them? Because we need uh, a mind or a, um, a substrate, a straight or substructure, you could say, that is able to string all of these pearls together on a single string, right? Because again, it's not right. just that I'm going to, oh, well, all I have to do is prove the existence of numbers, right? Well, it, the world is not just numbers. I mean, there's also other things going on. There's, you know, causation and all these other things. So mm -hmm. uh, I believe that all of those things are interrelated. And so we're what we're arguing for is a competing worldviews, competing paradigms. And my paradigm makes sense. It's coherent. I believe in a coherent view uh, in a limited sense of, of what's true. Okay. And so I have a worldview. I have a paradigm where there is a revealed uh, deity, God, who makes sense of those things. It makes sense that if man is made in the image of God, he has the ability to use logic, to use reasoning, analogically speaking, because he's made in the image of the divine mind of, of God. He has a mind like God has a mind. He can do uh, logic. He can do moral reasoning and so forth. Uh, I'm sorry. Again, have to pause here because... Just notice that what Jay's doing is um, answering a completely different question when it came to his worldview, right? I mean, firstly, what he's saying is that it makes sense on his worldview. His own worldview, yeah. Yeah, sense-making is presumably subjective anyway. Right? So it's no surprise that he finds his own world the one that makes sense. I mean, everybody who does presumably think that their way of looking at it makes more sense than another person's, but whatever. Um, he's saying it makes sense that if there was a divine mind, that that's why we would have knowledge of uh, abstract objects or whatever. I mean, like, maybe, right? I, I can sort of understand that, like, you know, if if you're just sort of thinking about what are the probabilities, sort of, if the world is entirely natural, that we would have knowledge of abstract objects against if the world was created by God and we would have knowledge of abstract objects. Okay, I, I think I can understand that, like, there's, it feels more intrinsically probable that if there was a god that you would have access to like weird abstract things than if there was no god i mean i think i can accept that right like but that's not the that's not the the problem before was something to do with um some he was arguing that you have to have uh, like against other forms of realism and nominalism but that's not to do with this question right and when it comes to divine conception like what he's done is thrown up a bunch of like rudimentary objections to realism and nominalism but hasn't considered any of the straightforward objections to divine conceptualism right like i mean it's one thing to say um well if there was a mind out there that was thinking logical objects then that's why they would exist but then you know people go well what do you mean a mind that e that exists forever thinking and in an unchanging way right like because well it seems intrinsic to to mind-like processes, they change, Sequences right? And, thoughts and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. And if you try and imagine your own mind not changing in any way at all, it would be as if the mind stopped completely, right? There wouldn't be any experience, right? Like it was like if you go to sleep and have a dreamless sleep, it just feels like you're not there at all. So like, how, in what sense is that a mind at all, right? Like that's the basic, like most head-scratching thing that philosophers worry about with divine conceptualism is it's like it doesn't even feel like you're talking about a mind now where you just talk you're just repackaging platonism and saying 
there's this mind that's utterly unlike our mind, right? But what's that? Like, so he doesn't seem to think that that's, you know, a good objection, but he doesn't even consider it. He's just like, yeah, so divine conceptualism, that's fine. <laughs> and, and moves on as if there's nothing to talk about there. It's like, mm, I don't know, triggers me a bit. Venus, what are you trying to say? You should speak up more. You, I see you keep trying to speak up, and then you stop yourself. No, I don't want to cut anyone off, but... Um, no, don't worry about I it. Think Feel the free. Thing with, like, sense, the thing with, like, sense making, maybe... Maybe it's trying to, I don't know, give some abductive argument or something along the lines of his... I think he calls it a paradigm or something. Is like, sort of the only paradigm in which these things are not left unexplained, whereas any other paradigm you can offer... There's always going to be something left unexplained. Maybe that's where his. Maybe that's yeah. that's the type of idea that he's working with. So when I had a conversation with him, that was almost the first thing I said was, "It sounds like you're making an inference to the best explanation." And he immediately was like, "No, no, no, it's not that. It's a transcendental argument. It's much stronger than that." And okay, fine. So he's explicitly saying it's not just a. <laughs> uh, well, this ex you know this seems like the best explanation so that's what i've gone with he thinks it proves the conclusion so yeah i it seems it sounds like it and again i think he's oscillating between an argument with easier to defend premises um and then moving over to one that's more ambitious that has premises that he can't defend and pretending that that the conclusion of that one is his conclusion so I feel like I can remember you, I don't remember if it was in the debate or somewhere else, but like kind of poking fun at him for using an abductive argument when he wants this like extremely strong, straightforward like deduction. Well, I mean, it's just kind of, I, I think that the best way to put it is about like moving between you know, one being cheap to run, but not very helpful. And the other one being impossible to run, but has the conclusion he wants. And it's just moving between those two in a waffly way it makes it seem like he's doing the ambitious thing when actually he's not. So, you know, it shouldn't matter. The whole point of this, if he's, in, if he's clear, then he shouldn't, anytime it seems like he's making inference to the best explanation argument, he, he should be like, oh, well, but obviously I'm not making that argument. Or like all of that type of stuff is just irrelevant because he's making a much stronger argument. So, you know, we should be able to like ring a little bell or something each time he makes an inference to the best explanation type argument because that's explicitly not what he takes himself to be doing. So whenever he is doing that, it's like him trespassing against his own rules of debate or whatever, because like, that's not what he's actually arguing for. So it seems like it's also, there's like an oscillation of three arguments now, not just two. Mm -hmm. like a contingency, some kind of a transcendental argument, and some kind of an abductive argument. Yeah, that's right, definitely. Um, like God, so the whole idea of like you know being made in the image of God, I'm saying that I'm not saying it's true because it's stated in Scripture. I'm saying that the Christian paradigm makes sense as to why it would be that way. So I'm grounding these these uh, abstract things okay. in the divine mind because the divine mind is is unique and therefore it's my starting point. My starting point is not a finite. You can hear Troy kind of like noticing that he's like cascading off, going, okay, like, oh, wait, wait, where are we going? Well, because he'll just talk for five well, minutes at a time. Yeah, they do a lot. It's just so, just get to the point, like, and it's rarely yeah, on he'll, point at any point in that discussion. In that he'll just burn the clock out like that. I mean, I feel like the thing I could comment the most on is just his debate tactics. Like, he'll, he'll just burn the clock like that going off on these completely unrelated tangents that don't answer what you're asking about. Right. And I kind of, I kind of warned you about this. And I'm sure once you saw his, you know, debates with like Alex and others, you, you uh, knew what, what you're in for, but like, you have to be kind of forceful with Jay or else like you just will not ever like, it's like the water will just get so muddied by him talking about 5,000 different topics, not really saying anything clear, making a ton of different arguments. And it's like, it's not clear that you're like driving at something specific in a conversation with him unless you like hold him to it. And it'd be one thing if he could like within that speech, right? The answer to the, my question was there. It just, it never is, right? <laughs> it's just all right. That's pretty much irrelevant. Yeah, it's like my, my patience for rambling, like there's, there's people who just have a roundabout way of talking. And you know, that, that's okay as long as they're talking about the thing they're supposed to be talking about. 
I, I fully appreciate that I am one of those verbose people that <laughs> say anything. So that's understand. Yeah. Man, we all appreciate it though. A lot of debates. Um, so I come from a. Uh, you also of... you also have a way of like taming these like insane sophists. Like I don't I don't know how. I was actually surprised when you finally managed to enrage Darth into not talking to you further. But like you did it with Jay. Like you know if you watch his conversation, I keep mentioning it, but his conversation with T Jump, like it's just a it's a shit show. It's just a complete disaster. If you watch me talk to him, also complete disaster. Troy, you know like. 75 percent disaster like it becomes a disaster and he like quits right you manage to you're like the the precept whisperer <laughs> oh, uh, did the video restart? oh i i just clicked the wrong place Does anyone remember roughly where we were at try clicking starting point. but but it doesn't matter again right? it doesn't that's matter whether you're a buddhist or whether you're a hindu Thing, it's a little before that, things, right? And that's why a lot of ancient religions have been either monistic or start with, um, you know, the, the basic questions of metaphysics, the basic questions of epistemology, and the basic questions of ethics, right? That makes up a mm. world of am I Am I ahead of where we are? Of the divine Sorry, mind I didn't mean to click of, of God. He has a mind like God has a mind. He it's one of those do, things uh, where, like, you know, do. if you get, um, uh, like, a gas that's, like, distributed enough in, a like, a tank, and then you took some film of like the movement of the particles and you reversed it, <laughs> you wouldn't be able to tell which one. So just the jumping into a J Dyer like monologue, you, you could be anywhere. <laughs> this could have yeah, been well, hours it, late. <laughs> right. It's funny, know. like, because when I listen for like, are we on track? Like, I'm literally just hoping to match a sentence with something I heard him say. It's <laughs> like, I can't, I can't look at the overall context and figure out the position. <laughs> But I will find it. Just one sec. Someone, if you notice, I'm before or after. Just say go back or go forward. I think you're about right. Moral and okay. so forth, um, okay. like God. So the whole idea of like you know being made in the image of God. I'm saying that I'm not saying it's yeah. true because it's stated in okay. scripture. I'm saying that the Christian paradigm makes sense as to why it would be that way. So I'm grounding <laughs> these these uh, abstract things okay. in the divine mind because the divine mind is is unique and therefore it's my starting point my starting point is not a finite human mind because if i go with nominalism and empiricism i'm stuck in the box of all the limitations and self-refutations that, that empiricism leads to yeah, but my and question so, and, and so i know your your question is <laughs> well, by the impossibility of the contrary there's no other paradigm that gives a coherent account there there of, right oh, there, there okay yeah. you can you can you can see the second he said that you'll see the chat just erupt with me right. for like the next hour because <laughs> like the second he said that i was like he's dead like there's there's no getting out of it he just said the thing troy's gonna completely kill him on that exact point and not budge for like the whole rest of the conversation that's what happens right the impossibility of the contrary right. this is him saying thing to say i was just like right that's... and i know i Sorry? We we say that jokingly in like our personal conversations about when we're trying to make arguments for things that are just ridiculous. I mean, a, another thing too is like, um, it's crazy how he moves from one sentence where he makes this very weak sort of abductive sounding claim to this like incredibly um, strong claim, the <laughs> possibility of the contrary with like no breakage at all. Like it's just all one uh, coherent yeah. structure. It's just, it's wild to me. Yeah. When, when the contrary is every other possible worldview. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I guess they're not possible, weak, but yeah. it's this weak claim that the, the Christian paradigm makes sense as to why some things might be the way that they are. That, I mean, is already much weaker than his original statement that he made in this debate, but then he follows it up like 10 seconds later with this incredibly dubious claim about the impossibility of the contrary. Well, and I know, I know that the Troyer is sensitive to that exact point from Darth. And it's like one of his like probably favorite things to like catch pre suffers out on because they'll say this, like they'll just throw out this language impossibility of the contrary when they're talking about every other worldview. Right. It's like, that's just the most, it's like the most insane claim and they can never, it's like, it's the most bold, ridiculous thing, one of, that they end up saying, right? So there's, uh, there's other funny ones that are like on par, like, you know, that there's like virtuous and vicious circularity. That's another one that like the second that said, the rest of the conversation is just asking them to make the distinction. But yeah, this is like the 
as far as I'm concerned, this is like the stupid precept statement. Like all other all other worldviews are con uh, contradictory. You say that, and you're just fucked. All of these things. Yeah, okay, good. good. Right. Sorry. Oh no. Sorry. Go ahead. No, I think he messed up when he said that because, like, I I spoke to Jack about this the other day. I think he should have made like a more modest claim or something that he's never came across another paradigm that could make sense of all of this and make like a weak mm. inductive claim. But now, the onus is upon him to provide some kind of a deductive argument or something. And when that's right, and so it's worth highlighting again this oscillation thing that's going on is you you can't have both that your argument is about this thing makes more sense on my view than it does on your view if you're also saying um my view's right because your view is impossible right like they're completely different types of claim one's a hard like deductive thing i'm proving that i'm right because your view's impossible or all other views are impossible and the other one is the the gentle like inference to the best explanation it just makes more sense or you know, out of all the ones I've come across, this seems like the the strongest view, everything else being considered or something. Like, if he's making the modest claim, fine. But he's jumped right into the middle of the most ambitious version of saying anything anyone's ever said. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it just can't, you can't, like, have it both ways. I think it's... it's he doesn't understand how ambitious of a statement it is, right? Like, yeah. well, we're gonna we're gonna see this play out. Also, just quick little note, uh, Venus. When you say uh, he fucked up, I assume you mean like like he fucked up at debating, not he fucked up at articulating his own beliefs. Like, you don't think he doesn't actually believe this, and he's just spoke wrong. Well, you think oh, no, he I mean, fucked like, up by trying I mean, to like, use this argument? He made a claim that he can't that he can't like justify. Yeah, because he has not backed off this. He holds to it for the whole discussion, and he is still stating it in future in debates that have happened since this. Um, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna see this play out. I mean, you guys all notice it, but just you know, for the people watching, you can kind of be sensitive to this. Like, Jay doesn't understand what he is, what the task is that he's setting for himself when he makes a statement like that. He doesn't understand that now he actually has to somehow demonstrate that every other view is contradictory and we're gonna see so many bullshit moves here so we're gonna see him try to say things like all well there's like a finite amount of starting points that other worldviews can have right and it's like okay even if we grant that that doesn't answer the question right you have to do this further kind of thing of like you have to show that those are the only starting points that a worldview can have and then granting worldviews like have starting points or whatever the fuck um you have to show they're the only ones, and then you have to rule them all out as contradictory, right? So it's right. like just saying that there's a finite amount. It's like, A, you haven't established that, but B, then you have to rule out that category as contradictory. He'll also try to say, well, you know, you put your worldview on the table. Once he starts getting really frustrated, he starts trying to go down that, like, put escape hatch, basically. <laughs> but I, I was just going to say one more thing about that, uh, which that's just worthless, right? Because, like, say he totally fucks your worldview up. It's like, you still haven't proven that every other worldview is contradictory, right? So how how does that get you to the conclusion, right? So he's going to try a whole range of these garbage things that aren't actually showing the contradiction, and I think the reason is he doesn't understand what he's tasking himself with when he makes that statement. Oh, I, had, I had a quick question, if you guys don't mind. Um... Well, I guess this is to people who know him, his views pretty well. So like Troy or Alex, um, when he says, well, I guess it's related to like what he takes um, truth to be. But when he says um, the, you know, the contradiction and all the other worldviews, I can understand him in two ways. One way is like a trivial sense. So imagine there's like some correspondence relation between worldviews and, you know, the quote unquote actual world. And then in, in a sense, every, every worldview that doesn't, have the orthodox christian god is contradictory right i mean just because it's just like the argument would just be the, the christian god exists so therefore there's a contradiction right but if he means it in a kind of like self-contained okay. right. way if he's he like some, that's like way stronger right that's just that's almost incoherent in a way because what you're saying is that for any um, let's just let's just treat them as kind of like quasi formal systems as worldviews, even though that's probably not a good way to do it. Um, for any worldview, you can derive a contradiction, and under no sense could someone revise their worldview in a way to avoid the contradiction. So, 
I'm not even sure how that makes any sense, but maybe that's, we'll, we'll see that later on. But I was wondering what his views were on this, because one is trivial, and another one is, like, almost mad. Doug, well, doesn't Jay, like, fervently insist on coherentism about truth? Well, he says he's, like, somewhat of a coherentist, but the point is, like, it, it's definitely the latter, right? He's, he's definitely saying that his, the views are internally incoherent, all of them. Um, for one, because it would well, the first argument would make no sense, right? That why would he provide the precept argument? Because the only right. way to demonstrate the incoherence would be just to independently demonstrate the existence of God. So, well, just give your argument for that. And so this argument would be doing nothing. Um, I, what, I'm, what I'm not understanding is, suppose I, have, I put forward some worldview, um, and you say, well, there's this contradiction, right? And I say, oh, well, that's okay within my worldview. What I I mean, what does he mean by contradiction there? Because if it's it, the only way it would have any force is if there's some outside of worldview sense of contradiction that basically rules out. Um, yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, what if your worldview is that you're? I mean, I mean, okay, so you're going to say my worldview is contradictory? Yeah, because like the claim is some contradictions are true. Right. So right. that person isn't going to think that there's anything wrong with somebody pointing at the contradiction and saying, you believe that this contradiction is true. It's going to say, yeah, that's right. So it feels like Jay is smuggling in at least that um, as a bit of landscape that's worldview invariant. Right. right. But, you know, where, where did we agree on, on that type of stuff? Right. Like there's a whole bunch of, and as I said before, there's a whole bunch of presuppositions of presuppositionalism which don't go stated by the person making the argument. They just sort of, uh, well, presuppose when they are talking to you, you know, things like everybody's got a worldview or whatever. Um, they ne we never get to talk about that. That's just the beginning of the conversation. And you have to start arguing with that machinery in place. But yeah, my worldview might be that not everybody's got a worldview or something. I don't know why that is uh, always taken without argument. Okay, this, this sort of thing I'm looking for. Um, so, yeah, any other worldview is, which doesn't include the uh, Orthodox Christian God as, as the sort of foundation right. or the or the transcendental precondition, whatever, leads to absurdity or is right. impossible. And so the question is, how do you, in order to back up that claim, right, you're going to have to assume for any arbitrary view which doesn't include the Orthodox Christian God as a necessary precondition, um, you're gonna have to derive some sort of contradiction or absurdity. Right. right. So how do you how do you do that? I mean, what is the argument? For that? Well, I mean, there are limited numbers of uh, steps that you can go in any worldview. There's not an infinite number of worldviews if we think of starting points. Now, I mean, conceivably there could be, I guess, an infinite number of variations down the line in people's worldviews, but every worldview has a limited number of places that it can go when you start with, um, you know, the, the basic questions of metaphysics, the basic questions of epistemology, and the basic questions of ethics, right? That makes up a worldview. And there's not an infinite number of ways that you can answer the basics of those those uh, disciplines. So, okay, so... <laughs> We're gonna, yeah. Well, I mean, just very quickly, it, again, we see Jay's arbitrary list come out again, right? Because, well, a worldview for him is answering his the list of questions about his topics he wants to talk about. So there was no mention of, of uh, politics on there, right? So it's weird, right? Because someone might be um, nationalist or something, um, much more than they are Platonist. And that could be much more important to them and shape the way that they see the world and be the thing that I would be describing as their worldview. Um, but for some reason, Jay doesn't even think that counts as a worldview. Only things that count as a worldview are uh, taking positions on meta ethics, um, metaphysics. And it's like, it is really obscure. Most people don't think about these things at all and they don't mean anything to them. They don't care about it. And their views of the world are tainted by completely different things. Um, so I just want to flag again the weird and arbitrary and whatever idea of there being these specific things. And I mean, let, well, let's just quickly say a few words about the thing. I mean, in what sense are we starting, right? I didn't like wake right. up as a freshly born baby and think, okay, well, I better make my mind up about 
tactics before I move on to think about anything else, right? It's not chronologically starting. I mean, and it declares that he's not a foundationalist later on or something. So I just, I don't know what starting point means here. I mean, often you will make up ethical decisions and outlooks um, before you make up your mind about meta ethics. And you know, it can come last. Uh, I don't really get why those have to be starting points. In fact, I think starting point is just a metaphor that doesn't really have any precise meaning at all. Yeah, it's just his way of, you know, he's got a list and he also underlines things. That's basically what a starting point is, just the things that he underlined. I really don't see anything else here that's, that's significant about the ones he calls starting points. I don't know if it, it seems different to you guys, but... Well, see, I was fine with him using this arbitrary list, so long as it would help him to make his argument, right? I mean, he could carve <laughs> up the different worldviews that exist in whatever ways he wants, so long as he could rule out all other worldviews. I mean, that was that, that that would demonstrate his argument, right? Well, yeah. So the, the point is that um, the arbitrariness could be tolerated if there was some utility damage. Right. Doing it. But... And, like, even if they're not starting points, if it's like, if he just said somehow, like, everyone has a belief about these specific things, and, like, these, like, I mean, that who, that doesn't make sense, but, like, just assume that, and then he's saying, like, these beliefs can only be made sense of in virtue of God or something like that, or, like, you could only have the belief if God actually existed, or whatever exactly he's saying. It's like, I don't know if, like, even focusing on the language of starting point, like, I agree, it's it's unclear, who knows what the fuck he's getting at, it's not chronological, in what sense is it a starting point, sure, but, like, I just assume that, like, minimally, it's something like, there are certain propositions that, like, everyone has a belief about, and you can only have those, th that only s it somehow makes sense or is justified or whatever if God exists. Like, he's just trying to pick a common feature of all these worldviews and then somehow target that whole, like, category of features. Because, um, mm -hmm. like, he's replying to Troy right now. Like, Troy's saying, like, what's the argument that, you know, all other worldviews are contradictory? He's saying, well, they all have a finite starting point. Like, I guess that what I'm saying, being kind of charitable to Jay, is, like, Let's just forget the word starting point. Like, he's just saying they all have a common feature, and then he's going to show some problem with that common feature, like if God doesn't exist or something like that. Yeah. So surely I, that's like this, yeah. So what he's worrying about is that you could say, well, there's an infinite number of worldviews, and what you have to do is one by one uh, yes. knock, knock each of them down. And he's worrying about that being the answer. So what he's doing is right. he's saying, even if there were infinitely many variations, I can... In, like if, even if what we're talking about is a kind of probability space that's dense so there's like infinitely many points on it he doesn't have to worry about like you know one by one going through each of those infinitely many points because he can impose right. a sort of interpretive grid over that and one right. by one knock out sectors of it so he's limiting right, exactly. the number of things he has to knock yeah. out yeah that's what's going on and he keeps yeah, interpreting me as saying or as like suggesting that he would have to go through them one by one when that's not what i'm saying and we spend right. some time on this point. Yeah. I, I think there's, there. I mean, you can't prove these kind of things, really. I don't think there's enough here to prove this. But there uh, there is a question in my mind about if that's intentional. Like, is that, like, straight up sophistry or is he really not tracking you? Because, like, you really do point out, like, repeatedly in here. You're like, look, I can grant that. I can, I can grant that there's a finite amount of starting points, okay? But you have to somehow show with that well, finite amount that... Yeah, sorry. Well, yeah. Just yeah, I was just gonna say, you, like you basically like grant that for the sake of argument, and then say it's still on you to show that all of those views that you've now narrowed from an infinite amount to a finite amount of categories, right? You have to show that there's a problem with each of those categories, right? And he keeps replying to that by strawmanning you into like saying that he has to go one by one through each view. So it's like, is he just not tracking that you're granting he doesn't have to go one by one, and then asking something further, which is show there's a problem with each category? Or so is it just what I think faith? is what's happening or what happened is when when I say no 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 but you do in fact have to refute all the world views, it could be infinitely many. He interprets me as saying you'd have to go through them one by one in order to refute them. But mm -hmm. that's of course not the only way in which you could refute them. You could refute a whole bunch of them at a time, um, you know, classes of them or whatever, um, by focusing on the starting points. That would suffice. If he could do that to refute all the other worldviews, right? That's that's mm -hmm. what I was like. 
other issues aside, that, as we've been discussing, but I was willing to grant that he could um, take that task on to, to demonstrate his premise. Yeah, but of no, course, I, he's I never think... going to do that. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was the right approach because it's like, look, I'll make your I'll make your task as easy as possible for you. I'll just grant you all this shit, and now now do that for me. Show that all of these finite categories that all of the infinite worldviews fit into are each contradictory, right? And he just keeps going away from it. But yeah, I guess I'll continue. And to be clear, he'd also have to show that um, either what remained, like what the responses he gave on the Orthodox Christian view, were like those responses are unique to that view, or mm -hmm. you have to do some additional work to rule out any others that would fall under that same class, right? That would give all those same answers. That's right. One of the things I was right. thinking was, well, if we're just talking about basic uh, starting point questions, like are numbers real or fucking, uh, you know, whatever the starting point questions are, okay, maybe that imposes a sort of um, a coarse grained way of uh, looking at all of this probability space so that you can knock out chunks of it at a time. But then it's deeply implausible that what you find when you knocked out all of the sectors and left just one is that that only contained orthodox Christianity. Because well, right. that's like saying there's eight questions or whatever it is, he says. Say, say there's a hundred questions or something. But only orthodox Christianity answers exactly those. And and they're not, you know, most of them won't be questions about um, theology, right? These are right. The, level questions about worldviews that everybody answers so i mean how is it going to leave just that one religious view on the table <laughs> it just doesn't seem right like other types of theism would obviously st if if everything he said went through there'd be other very similar looking versions of theism like like even other types of christianity yeah a quadrinity yeah. right just maybe right. <laughs> why not that one right that solves the problem of the one and the many as well as his version does right however it's, well, it's supposed to unless, I mean. uh, well yeah um, <laughs> Yeah. Unless I'm missing Whatever something, is, even. it se it seems like technically, if he actually really did achieve his his goal here of showing only Orthodox Christianity could, or every other worldview is contradictory, there wouldn't be some further point about you know ruling out other views that can give the same answers as Orthodox Christianity because if he had really achieved the initial goal, he would have he would have done that, right? He would have shown that all those other like potential Christian like views or views that can give no, similar answers some no, no. no because um those other Christian like views wouldn't be distinguished on, on the basis of their answers to these basic questions. Right. Yeah, he wants to say that Orthodox the Christian theism is is the one, the only one that's coherent. So if there's if there's some other right, view, if... whether it's Christian or not, that gives the same answers to the basic starting point. He'd also have to show by some additional work yeah. um, that those are incoherent why as well. Would, sorry, but why would why would the work be additional if he was really showing that every other wor worldview is contradictory? It would include those views. So how would it be well, additional? Well, it's all part of the same project, right? But in terms of what I kind of laid out that he might do, right? Yeah, Based if it's just about what he yeah, if it's right. just about what he might do, like somehow he chunks through a bunch of categories and then. It turns out actually he's kind of missed a category of like Christian like views that can give similar answers but aren't quite his view, then that's fine. But that would that would be that he didn't actually do the first step correctly. There is this kind of thing he overlooked. It's not yeah, actually yeah. he could do the first step correctly and then still have more work. And I think of it being like um so it's almost like he's saying um that he's the best person in the world, right? And the way he's gonna um argue that is he's not going to go through one by one each person in the world and uh, explain how he's better than that person. What he's going to do is say, well, I'm better than everyone who's French, and I'm better than everyone who's German, and I'm better than... and just go through each country, mm -hmm. and that way knock out cl classes of people. But then when he's finished, he's just got him and every other American person. And that method that he's applied so far isn't going to say that he's the unique best person, because there's a whole bunch of people that that method you know, equates with him. All the other american well, people right just to, knocking to, out other people by country doesn't give you a unique person at the end that's basically right the so point. yeah I, I appreciate that point but yeah so I, i'm just trying to be charitable to him i'm just saying like if if the grid he lays over the probability space say it say it's too it's too i guess coarse is probably what yeah. we'd say that it in fact chops out all these other types of views but then there's a range of views left around him, yeah, right? Yeah, then, of course, he hasn't achieved his... I, I understand that. So, right. But the, the charitable thing would be that he's... Which, this obviously isn't the case, but like he's somehow sensitive to that, and he actually does 
um, lay out the grid such that he, you know he's got these big coarse grain categories and then this one super fine category of like just his view <laughs> oh, yeah, well, but he could set up the questions that so that he could do that right set up yeah. all the questions that would specify you know orthodox these and as, as, and then so that <laughs> um you have you know a set of answers that only orthodox theism would give and so it's the same project, right? I mean, that. if one of the questions was, does it rhyme with schmorthodox? <laughs> then, you know, fine, that would live. And denying that is uh, incoherent, yeah. You can't, you can't ground numbers without that. <laughs> you know, does the external world exist or not? <laughs> is there, uh, uh, are there objective but, ethics I mean, or not? Uh, could, you one, know, you're... could one word of the Bible be changed? <laughs> right. Because that, right, it right. like that's the deeper issue, right? Like, you could, you could grant that Trinitarian. You could grant that a God is required, that it's a Trinitarian God, that it's an incarnate God, all these things, right? But that doesn't get you to Christianity. That just gets you to Trinitarian incarnate gods, right? So how it doesn't do you get it doesn't get you to was Jesus on that day? Right? Yeah, <laughs> Jesus on that day in that place, right? Yeah. Uh, I just don't understand. I mean, there should be. It, it it seems like the position is so crazy that it's suggesting well that they're committed really to saying there's an a priori argument that will establish that yeah you know there's an a priori argument for what the text of the bible would be i mean i i guess as a an orthodox christian he might not be so wedded to the literal bible but you know that's more of a protestant thing but i guess he's going to have some tradition of whatever i mean i really actually don't know much about what the doctrines of well they they they, they think they think that there's more than one source of authority and so scripture yeah. is just one source you know that's right but presumably you can't like knock it out right you can't just say it's it's in general I mean, right? yeah, wouldn't they yeah. have to say that all those sources are necessary if, if 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 they collectively define the orthodox view um they're all going to be integral yeah and it's like what if you know john of damascus's seminal text or whatever happened to just be burnt in a library by the mongols or whatever and we didn't have it now would everyone have knowledge is impossible possible? yeah is that right is that <laughs> right? <laughs> i mean like prior to prior to like the doctrines of eastern orthodoxy being like canonized and whatnot like in the ancient greeks have like all the possibility of knowledge or no, they were incoherent mess. <laughs> or what about? I'm not even sure. Like, what about just the the Old Testament figures, right? Because mm. they didn't actually they don't they didn't presumably know about the Trinity and you know and the essence energy things, distinction. Right? <laughs> <laughs> More nonsense as well. They're saying that Jesus of Nazareth is required in order for knowledge and intelligibility to be possible right so I, yeah the question is like what's going on prior to the incarnation well he, he could say that um they were still able to you know be intelligible and have knowledge they just weren't able to have a world view which could be grounded they just didn't have a paradigm right um unless god like gave it to them somehow um, but all the same, because on their view, God does exist and He's made the world in this way. They're yeah, allowed, they're able to do those things. Go ahead. It, it's difficult to reconcile all of the claims at the same time because, like, okay, on that reconstruction, then he should never have said that um, having alternative worldviews destroys the possibility of knowledge, which is what he said. So, like, if that's right, then you do actually have to just bite the bullet and say, actually, Aristotle just didn't know anything. It was impossible for him to know anything because, and, and even, you know, other Christians who aren't Orthodox Christians, they don't know anything, right? Like it destroys the possibility of knowledge. Like if you want to say, well, no, you can believe stuff on other views. You just won't have a coherent explanation of what you believe in. Right. Then that doesn't destroy the possibility of knowledge. Like it means you can actually know stuff on those views. So again, we're oscillating, or Jay's oscillating between a really strong claim, a really ambitious claim, 
and then the actual things he says that are supposedly like justifying that are just justifying much weaker arguments that don't have anywhere near as ambitious. Uh, yeah, it took him to be meaning I mean, that that weaker claim when he says destroys the possibility of knowledge. That um, it just means that on that worldview, if you know if that worldview is correct, then knowledge is impossible. That's all I took him to mean. But it might come across as something stronger. That that is to say, if you have that worldview, then then knowledge is impossible, regardless whether your view is correct. Yeah, I mean, so again, it's just this ambiguous between if the things that you believed were true, or if it was true that you believed those things. Like, like right. one is a claim about the external world, and one's a claim about what's in your head. And like, which which of those are we supposed to be looking at? Like, is a worldview just what would be true if everything you believed was true? Is 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 it a claim about the external world, or not? Like, which one is it? I wish we could just, you know, get clear on those things. Like, put a pin in them and keep referring back. Like, no, no, by worldview you don't mean that. You mean this or something, so that we could like straighten it all out. But Sorry. Yeah, the ambiguity around that term is definitely a pain. I mean, I've had a kind of related problem dealing with Darth because he doesn't actually want to accept the definition of worldview, like, you know, the group of beliefs that you have. And he won't, he won't give a definition. He'll just insist that certain things are worldviews. So there's the Christian worldview, but a worldview doesn't refer to just the set of beliefs you have. So it's not, it's not really clear what the fuck he's saying. There's the same problem with Jay. Well, yeah, you have to. It's it's well, an answer. I, sh I should be list of questions that he. I, I should be. I should be clear. Maybe there's not the same problem with Jay because maybe Jay would just accept that it's just the set of beliefs you have. But no, it, the, I mean, it becomes it's totally absurd if it's beliefs you have because like it's trivial to think of someone having consistent beliefs because just think of someone who only believes one proposition. Like obviously there are non-Christian worldviews that are not inconsistent, right? The guy who just thinks P. I mean, you can complain about that guy, but you can't say he's being inconsistent because he'd also have to at least believe, not be, right? So I'm trying to think. Obviously, isn't being inconsistent. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to think of what Jay would even say to that. Like, I could only speculate. I would. I think he'd probably try to talk about like implicit beliefs, or maybe he would just try to say it's impossible to have only one belief, but then not be able to show why it's impossible. Well, no, like, I think he's just going to say so that's not a worldview because it's not answering arbitrary list questions. Right. But you'd or also yeah, say or that maybe it just that. doesn't make, doesn't ground the possibility of knowledge, which is actually for some reason like integral to him. Wait, why <laughs> would... It doesn't mean that it's in incoherent, but all the same, go ahead. Well, I was saying, why wouldn't he just say that even in believing one proposition, there's like concepts there that in order, you know, that, that move... Right, you reject the atomism, whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's right. Although maybe I'm giving him too much credit, I don't know. That's that's what I would do if I was in that weird situation where I had to defend this. <laughs> I think he actually... It's weird, because I could picture him doing something that's like a semantic, holist kind of move, but I don't know if he'd he'd go all the way to you have to... You know what, actually, I, I would really not be surprised if he tried to do something loosely like that, like to have like any belief, you have to have all these other ones, and... I don't know if he'd go all the way to holism, but he'd try to at least get like his things on the table, like um, you know about about knowledge or maybe numbers or something like that. I'm convinced if he wasn't a Christian, he would just be like a hardcore Quinean. That's just that's the only way I can make sense of this guy. <laughs> and Van Til does that holism thing, and Darth does it as well. Yeah, yeah. You're limited at the number of ways that you can go, and. You know, in terms of uh, worldviews, we're also, at least in the ones that we... So also got to point out, here's him again doing the same thing, right? Pointing out you're limited. So all, he, all he's going to do is just lay the grid, but then not start taking out the chunks of the grid. And he's yeah. just going to keep trying to lay the grid over and over. And Troy's going to grant that, and he's just going to go, what, you're expecting me to just go one by one? We typically interact with. We're not usually interacting with that many worldviews. Most worldviews, for example start out with um, basic principles of monism or dualism. Um, now, Christianity is unique because it's neither monist nor dualist. It has a more uh, nuanced tiered system to reality. But just for example, hierarchy of, the of being and stuff like that, or is that what you're talking about? Say what? Like I mean, hierarchy of being and stuff like that, or, is, or are you talking about something else? Well, I'm just using metaphysics as an example of the okay. fact that typically when you interact in an apologetic way with other religions, 
you find that there's not actually that many different positions on something like what is the fundamental nature of reality? Is it all one thing or is it all two things? And that's why a lot of ancient religions have been either monistic or dualistic. And I'm just using that as an example to show that if, if you look at the metaphysics of any system, most of the time they're either monistic or dualistic in a lot of religions, right? So I don't know, I don't have to refute every single infinite worldview because there's a limited number well, of ways you can go. So th there's the move. We could just, we could make right. a running tally. Right, you're not asking him to refute every worldview. Just you know, go go bit by bit if you want to break it into categories. Well, there's this ambiguity I mean, because it is. I mean, right. the whole point of his method is that that's his way of taking out large groups of worldviews. Right. The only thing is that we're not asking you to do each one, one individually one. on its own. One. But and then so there's this constant like confusion there, where whenever Troy was saying stuff like, "Well, I'm not asking you to." to do all of it he'd be like i know that dummy or whatever and it was just getting well i mean there's about 20 minutes of just this one point being discussed i know it's ridiculous it just maybe i could have tried to state it better um to no he just needed to listen to you but, yeah. you stated it perfectly clearly he just was not listening to you wasn't interested in what you had to say right i mean i thought that, that... So, but... yeah that's also charitable that he just wasn't listening or wasn't tracking like i mean could be that he, he was and understood there was a problem and was trying to get away from it. But we'll never I mean, know. even if we suppose that there's only a limited number of possible worldviews, I'm not sure that there is. It seems we could have any number of um, okay. How, if I, if I ask but, basic, Hold on. So if I ask basic questions in metaphysics, um, how, how many different ways do you think those questions can be answered? For example, but, um, but, is there an but, external world or not? Like, is there an infinite right. number of ways to answer that question? No, perhaps not, right? But but that's not what I'm saying, right? I, well, I was willing to grant that there are a limited question, number of worldviews. You ask the question of how do you not have to refute all possible worldviews, and I'm saying that because every worldview is limited in its beginning, starting point, steps. So I mean, right there, he's it's he's know. the two things together in a confusing way. I'm also going to start noting down each time he interrupts you, because. It was just actually ridiculous after a while. It's like everything you say, he interrupts. And, you know, so he'll like talk for five minutes. Um, then you go, I'll okay, like well, what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, not even that. You'll go, okay, so my question, no. <laughs> Words back. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it just, it's, for one thing, it's like, I don't know, it's just like a power move or something. It's just a, like, I'm not even going to let this guy speak. You know, it's almost like a fight or something. And it just shows, like, it's not good debating tactics. And later on, I mean, this, we're not going to get there, but later on he ends up complaining about something being ad hoc and he calls it a fallacy. And, like, if it's a, it's a type of fallacy where, like, it's something that you shouldn't do when having a debate because, like, it's not helpful in that part of the debate to do it. And actually interrupting you all the time, not listening, um, is like that. It's a type of fallacy, effectively, of, like, being a bad debate interlocutor, right? Like he's trespassing against the virtuous way of having a conversation with somebody by just not letting you speak i consider that to be as much of a fallacy as um introducing something without any justification like an ad hoc thing would be well i i pointed this out to detroyer also but jay has this one sort of debate move where he tries to get you to say something that or well or he picks a thing that you've said and once he sees something that he thinks he can, like, like kind of, like, mm -hmm. beat you over the head with, he'll really, like, even after the debate, you know, try to get his audience all sort of, like, giving you shit about this. Like, in the in the Detroyer debate, it's, um, yeah, that ad hoc isn't a fallacy, right? right? Which, uh, obviously, what you were saying is just that it's not a formal fallacy, which is not... Yeah, that's what I not... meant, although I think there's a good argument that it needn't be a fallacy at all, um, since you might not use it in an argument, and then... Could not give you a fallacy, but that's just another point. I mean, it's, okay. it's irrelevant anyway, right? Because I didn't use ad hoc reasoning, so no, that's right. And or in in my debate with him, it was um, at one point. I don't even think I said we should be logical. And if I if I had have said that, it would have been like in a kind of hypo norm sort of way, right? It's not. I'm not saying that there's some like 
I don't know, some like categorical norm about being logical or, or some, uh, where, <laughs> yeah, it's like, right. th we just should do this. There's no further explanation. It's not because of the goal, right? But I think I said either that or something like that. And then he tried to, he tried to represent it like, um, yeah, he, he, I don't know, just he kind of carried on with this, like, you said we should be logical, you said we should, and like even going on after the debate, right? So he'll often do this. He'll try to pick a thing that he thinks he can make you look bad over and then just like repeat it incessantly to give the impression that you're just like some complete idiot or something but it's usually not even not even on point so so what i mean you have to have so all i have to do the contract all I have is to correct do, because all i have to do is refute those starting points and the whole paradigm falls apart yeah as long as that um refuting those starting point refutes all other possible worldviews right but there, because but you're saying that worldviews contrary world to the Christian view, theism because, are impossible. Because if you're not understanding the limitations of philosophy. Like every worldview is limited in the beginning points of where you can go. So there's not an infinite number <laughs> of worldviews in terms of starting points. There's maybe an infinite number of variations down the line. But again, this sure. is like if you just look at comparative religion, you'll find that most religions in the world historically are either monistic or dualistic. Now, not every single one. I'm just giving that as one example of an easy way to cancel out almost all of the other religions out there. Right. So I can agree. Uh, just depending on what you mean by starting points, right? If, 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 if worldview starting points is just going to be responses to some basic metaphysical questions, then of course, yeah, there's going to be a limited number of starting points. Well, I mean, you're saying then, of course, as if uh, that wasn't clear. I mean, what, what, what else would a worldview starting point mean? than what I said. But I was talking about worldviews, like, um, some, some particular, not just about starting points. But but it doesn't matter. Again, right? it doesn't matter whether point... you're a Buddhist, or whether you're a Hindu, or whether you're a Muslim, or whether you're an atheist, or whether you're a so New so far from following. Everybody's going to have to answer and go in a limited number of either-or steps at the beginning of their worldview. Sure, that's fine. I mean, we can, we can grant that and suppose that this... Restricts the okay, number well, of possible if you, worldviews. If you, that if you grant have. that, then your original contention that I have to refute every worldview doesn't hold. <laughs> just he just keeps doing it, right? It's like uh, no, yeah. that that doesn't make sense. It, all that we get from there is that you can you still have to refute every worldview. It's just you can do it by category. There's a more efficient way to do it, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Right, you still no matter what when you say impossibility of the contrary and the contrary is every other worldview. It's like, no, you do have to falsify every, or show every other worldview contains a contradiction. All you're establishing is that there's a method for doing it that doesn't require going one by one. Not that you don't need to do it, right? His only, his only way to remove that task from himself is to take back the claim that the contrary is impossible. Right, exactly. You can't, you can't make that claim and then say, oh, well, there's a finite amount of categories, so I don't have to show each of those categories, and therefore still every other single worldview is contradictory. So it's just not following at all. Well, yeah, that's right. Because if those are the only ways that worldviews can be, then those are still all the worldviews, right? And you, it was well, your you claim, right? There's like an infinite number of worldviews. I have to refute them all. That, okay, and there's, there's another that's bullshit again, move, right? Because yeah. it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be that similar, but like slight, slightly different, right? Because it's not... It's not even just about whether it's an infinite amount or an extremely large amount. Like that's that's not important, right? We can we can say it's extremely large. We don't have to say it's infinite. Like the point is still if you don't want to go one by one through the extremely large or the infinite number, then you can do it by category, but the fact that you can do it by category doesn't get you out of the problem of having to do it one way or another. But you you catch the you catch the separate problem he's raising right about the whether the amount of other worldviews is infinite or finite it doesn't matter it could be infinite or just a big finite number it doesn't change anything you still have to show they're all contradictory or something well uh, i mean i do think there's an infinite number of possible worldviews not but that's not starting really points. relevant right look if i if i refer, right. let me give you an example okay. if, if a position starts out with um, like a basic assumption that all reality is uh, purely relativistic. And there's many worldviews, many religions that hold to that, right? That there's no epistemic certitude or certain truth. Everything is purely relative. And I refute that proposition by pointing out that that proposition itself is a truth claim that, that claims to be absolute and, a, and universal. 
And it doesn't matter whether that person is a, uh, a skeptic atheist or whether that person is a, uh, uh, you know, believes in Maya, everything's illusory, or just some random. Also, who has a view? I mean, how many people in the world have a view like this? That everything is relative, I mean, except for this claim, but this claim isn't, I don't know, whatever. Well, I mean, yeah, and like, so let's say you're a Hindu or whatever who who makes that move and says everything is relative, including the truth of this statement as well. So relative to something else, whatever the, the thing is, it, this statement might be false. And Jay points right. out, well, that doesn't make any sense, does it? And maybe he'd go, yeah, you know what, you're right. Actually, everything's relative apart from this sentence then. What about that? Like, well, the refutation is now gone. Whatever the refutation was, he hasn't refuted Hindu. You know? Yeah, <laughs> like, the refutation is only to the person who thinks that everything is relative and this statement is... Yeah, relative. right. <laughs> right. <I'm... laughs> okay, then they'll just revise the obviously clumsily stated thing in light of that objection. But you haven't refuted their worldview. It's like as if someone would just be like, oh, gee, I've never thought about that before. I better become an Orthodox Christian because, like... It, <laughs> Nobody would think that's refuted their worldview, right? That's insane. So he's not I guess out chunks of worldviews here, just like raising a really basic issue for a strong like, version of that view. To, to be charitable, though, maybe the maybe this is just meant as an analogy. Like, I think that probably is the case. This, like, everything's relative. It's just, it's just an analogy for, like, how... It, like, for, so we assume that that point is essential to a category of worldviews also. And we assume... That's just an analogy. So he's just saying in an analogous kind of way, all these worldviews <clears throat> categories will have some point like that that'll be self-defeating or have some kind of problem and I can show the problem with it. And if you say, well, they could just revise and have a different worldview. I think I think we're to take it that the the things he'll target are like essential or like in some way like central to the worldview, like well, something it wouldn't budge perhaps, on or something but then like it's that. A, it's a bad example, isn't it? I mean, like why give where it doesn't actually hold for the thing that he's... I mean, what we get is a, a promissory note which says, I can refute all other worldviews. Um, and when you ask him how, he goes, well, one, a bit like this. And then he gives you an example of not refuting, right. even the example he gives you. So and you've it's got just, it's also it's low-hanging fruit. Like, it's a... Yeah. The way it's defined is, like, just has a plain contradiction on, on, on the front, right? There's actually a, a concern I have um, that was just as I was listening to him, I realized. So, on his view, and someone will correct me if I'm wrong, he wants to basically take the set of worldviews. Let's just assume there's no like set theoretic problems with saying there's a set of worldviews because there might be, especially if you cash them out in terms of like propositions. But mm -hmm. let's just assume there is such a thing. Um, and he wants to divvy up, he wants to carve them up in a way so that you get one left over. Um, on so. The, this is going to depend on how big that set is. Um, like, if the cardinal, and this is be, maybe being a little overly uh, pedantic, but if if the set of worldviews is a certain kind of cardinality, even if it's infinite, then it does make sense. Like, if you want an analogy, imagine the naturals. You carve everything below one, and you carve everything above three. All you have left is two, so you have done that. But if you're working with a with a, a set like the reals. There's no number of um, like cuts you could make so that it picks out one um, one world view. It's impossible, right? Um, there's always going to be infinitely many, in, no matter how many cuts you give. So if he takes this is maybe being way too complicated, <laughs> but if he takes the set of worldviews to be a certain kind of cardinality or above a certain kind of cardinality, then it's just impossible. It makes no sense to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe, maybe I mean. He has an ingenious way of showing that it has to be this kind of cardinality. But wait, I have a question. If it if it can't it carve out a class and not just a single worldview? Yeah, but I then mean, I'm, the probably, I'm probably is, missing your point. Why here. even do the car? Look, I mean, if your goal is just to show that you need um, a, a a certain kind of god that has three parts and whatever, then just give the argument for why you need. You don't need to do any of this, like, uh, canceling out parts in this and this, right? Um, it kind of it seems like a really weird exercise in, like... Like, if I want to prove that the Christian God exists, um, why, instead of trying to carve out all these other options, just not give the argument for why the Christian God must exist? 
I mean, it's not so like if you wanted to prove that someone was guilty of a crime or whatever, um, you know, say there's video footage of three people getting on a train or something, and then ten minutes later that carriage is on fire. And I mean, if you could show that person A and person B didn't do it, then like maybe just by elimination or whatever, you could take yourself to have proven that it must have been the other guy. I mean, it's so you can see why it might make sense in some it's a basic level to, to argue. In yeah, that, yeah. In I, I completely agree with you on that account. But if you're if there's a, a real number of uh, like, yeah, yeah. People, <laughs> I'm thinking that, of a I'm thinking, thinking of a real happen. number right now. Can you? Uh, can I... <laughs> And we no, rule exactly. it out like a little bit at a time. Well, right? how, well, I mean, it, it just doesn't make any sense. So on, and I, I tend to think that worldviews, if they were a set of worldviews, it would actually be a really, really huge set. If not, like it might be so big that you can't even put it in the set. Um, so there's that concern. This is kind of what I'm bringing up. I don't know if it has a. If there was some measure that was continuous, like degrees of belief or something, and you could take any value on the real number. And that was part of your worldview. Like, you know, you could be like really super into Christianity or just like mildly so, and that the, the degrees were real numbers. Then there you go. You've got <laughs> you've got some continuous field introduced into worldview dynamics, and that makes it uh, so that you've got that many different options. I mean, we're totally speculating. I mean, this is this is kind of fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is why I said earlier that they kind of fucked up when they made that claim, because. He could just have, you know, made like the weaker claim of induction or whatever, mm -hmm. and then just had the Troyer give, uh, come up with like a paradigm that works. But now, like, the burden is upon him and he's like struggling. Yeah, definitely. I don't know what you guys listen to. He's destroying Detroit right now. Obliterating. <laughs> <laughs> Random dude on the street who's, you know, taking philosophy 101 and believes everything's relative. That refutes all those worldviews because that's a basic epistemic story. Sure. So I agree, right? Well, at least with the general approach. Suppose I can suppose that you can disprove entire classes of worldviews, right? All of those that have right. um, one of these problematic responses to these metaphysical questions. Right? But that's not going to be enough. Refuting some number of worldviews is not going to be enough to demonstrate your claim unless you can refute all of the worldviews which are not Christian theism. I mean, that's your claim. You're claiming that the, the, the alternatives are impossible. Well, that's one part of the argument. The argument is not just a negative reductio. I'm also positing a positive uh, uh, paradigm that's to be compared with any other paradigm. Okay, and, then you can do that and, after, but you said this was your claim. And you have it doesn't to, matter whether you, you do it before or after. You can do it either way, because sure, the argument whatever. is still the same, which, whichever chronological uh, start. What he's saying now is like, yeah, that's the premise of my argument, but my argument But I'm also making this is... argument, too, yeah. Every <laughs> point you use, the argument doesn't change. Sure, you're just so, giving yourself an extra burden there. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess the second one is not really needed if you can already show that the rest are incoherent or impossible, because then again, again, if yours I, is coherent to others or not, then... Right. A, so what I'm doing is comparing paradigms. And sure. everybody has a paradigm. And if I, unless you want to be like, uh, I'm not saying you, but hypothetically, unless the person wants to be a, a sophist and be like, oh, well, I don't have to accept any position in uh, epistemology, ethics, and metaphysics. Well, if you do that, then you can't debate. So you're, you're a sophist, Alex, for thinking something like that could be the case for someone that maybe they just haven't thought about any of these questions, but nonetheless still, you know, have a worldview. Well... He's, so he says then that if you take that, if you're like that, then you, what you do is you can't debate. But it's like, it doesn't mean some, you know, you try and debate and what happens is you burst into flames or some force of logic prevents your hand from unmuting yourself in the, <laughs> in the server or whatever, right? Like, you obviously can debate, right? Like, physically you can. What he's saying is it's against the rules to do that, right? He's just, in, and it's just like, well, who made those rules? And they're Jay's rules, basically. I mean, I didn't sign that contract that said I won't open my mouth unless I answer Jay's list of questions first, right? It's just not a rule, really, that I <laughs> acknowledge. So, you know, too bad, buddy, I can debate. And just telling me that it's not that I'm not allowed to is and in itself something that doesn't have any force, right? 
and even if you can't debate whatever that means um it, it still doesn't get his argument off the ground right it doesn't saying the person can't debate or whatever um isn't the same as saying their worldviews entail a contradiction yeah um, that's right that's what he'd need for his argument yeah or but saying he wants that to say wrong. the same thing just if you can say that they can't debate <laughs> i mean it seems to me also that like say i'm a hindu and i believe something contradictory about ethics or whatever that doesn't that doesn't mean hinduism's wrong right even if my worldview contains a country even if i'm con that doesn't mean my worldview is wrong right in fundamentally it might be right anyway and i'm just a confused person who holds those beliefs i mean so yeah it has even if well, he said it's a that, paradigm level worldview. contradiction whatever that well okay means. so say i have some contradictory belief about metra or whatever right like so what that doesn't mean hinduism is false yeah it has to be it has to be a contradictory belief about something quote paradigm level that's also essential to hinduism well, right it's, it's the it's the sort of contradiction well, which like destroys your worldview i think he, he says this at some point like destroys the whole worldview. yeah which, but, but do, do you see do you see a rare but do you see a problem with how I just said it, Alex? Because, like, yeah, you're a Hindu, you make some contradictory statement. It's like, okay, your worldview's fucked, but, that, or, well, until you revise it, but Hinduism isn't, right? I think yeah. what he must be wanting to go at is, he must, he must be wanting to say that the statement you make is somehow essential to Hinduism, right? Like, it's not just your Alex's worldview. It's like this, this contradiction about some paradigm level thing is also position well, that one must take to be a hindu I, well okay so if uh both sides of the contradiction were essential to hinduism then hinduism would be wrong even if i didn't believe in any of those things right and then the question would be it you know now we're talking about uh, is are we making a metaphysical claim here or are we making an epistemic one like are you talking about me and my beliefs or are you talking about what i believe like which one of those two things is it because it just seems clear that like you could find all sorts of problems with what i you know my mental state and how confused i am and not show anything about the way the world is right that just seems to be pretty straightforward but then again if you're just talking about like the propositions themselves that make up hinduism are contradictory then you don't need to reference my beliefs at all it's nothing to do with me right even if i happen to believe those your, your problem is with those propositions not with me right so you yeah, have pick one of those you stick stick to it but don't muddle them together that's that's my problem with this sure also why why would you be a sophist if you don't what if you're just like agnostic on on metaethics on epistemology right. and physics why are you like a sophist and why can't you engage in a debate like why can't you debate that <laughs> there doesn't seem to be a sound argument for any position in those fields yeah it's, it's just absurd isn't it I mean, you'll have to ask Jay Dyer. You know, I, I do have an ability to sometimes manage to somehow set up debates with Jay Dyer. So, if you want to have a crack at him, no, I wouldn't want to debate. Also, can can we all can we all acknowledge that Dor Doorman turned down a debate with Ray Comfort? Matt Dillahunty did it instead of you. eh? you could have been in there arguing with the Banana Man. I also turned that down, but he would have wanted to talk about evolution, <laughs> right? I mean, that's. <laughs> I mean, I feel like if I ever accept that kind of debate, then it's like officially over for me. Like I've just given up on life. <laughs> you can argue anything. So that kind of like super agnostic relativism can't even come to the table. So yeah, uh, by necessity, uh, if you accept that philosophy is, uh, that, uh, you know, basically what we mean is a worldview, a paradigm, um, again, you are very much limited in those three domains. I don't, I don't know how else to say this uh you know if if somebody makes a really really extremely strong statement like all truth is relative i mean that completely destroys the possibility of knowledge at all and that knocks out a gigantic portion of worldviews right yeah, so i can example. i can agree that's, yeah that's a gigantic portion how would that destroy the possibility of knowledge why wouldn't that just make knowledge itself relative mm-hmm Right. Well, if you're the if you're so lame that you trip over your own shoelaces, everything's relative, but this statement isn't relative. If you're that guy, right, then there's a problem. I guess it doesn't destroy a possibility of knowledge because you just go, oh yeah, well, that's not the right way to say it.
let me be clearer and then restate it in some different way. So I agree for the sake of argument that relativism about truth is incoherent or something like right. that. And that any worldview which is relativist about truth is is false for that reason. Well, that's just granted. Okay. Sure. I mean, and, and, and I, you could yeah. argue that about a bunch of other things too, but unless okay. you can argue that about uh, in a way which um, applies to all other worldviews, you haven't demonstrated the falsehood, let alone the impossibility of the contrary. If the no, because that's if the if what we're arguing over makes knowledge itself impossible, then it is a cancellation of all the other worldviews. That's why I don't have to go into all the specifics. Because everybody has a few basic places that they have to start in their worldview. He just keeps doing it. I know. It's just it's just over and over. Period. Yeah. Like, so you, I was you, have, you have yeah. to. That's why I listed the transcendental preconditions. That's what we're talking mm -hmm. about here, right? So how many worldviews can give an account for those? Well, you're saying that there's only one. That's that's right. your claim. So how do you demonstrate that? I, I swear, the hope there is that, on his part, is that. You say, like, this worldview can, or this can, or a few mm -hmm. of these can, and then you start trying to run worldviews, and he gets to, right. you know, play play offense, right? But he fucked himself when he made that claim. By challenging it and going up against any other worldview or critiquing yeah. any of the yeah, erroneous yeah. positions the and starting switch. points. No, no, hang on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is the move into that, like, inductive kind of approach, where it's like, well, look, uh, like, give me your worldview, and I'll I'll falsify it, or something like this. It's like, okay, but then don't claim all others are contradictory. Drop that argument, and then try to make an inductive case or something. You're gonna have to demonstrate there are no basic starting points for worldviews if you're gonna hold up all the argument <laughs> you're trying to make. No. So yes, you are. You're, let me give me a minute. You're yeah, claiming you're still trying that... to argue that there's an infinite variation of worldviews, and until I demonstrate every no, single one of them, no, I mean, all whatever. Let's let's suppose <laughs> that there's some one number that <laughs> makes good. no difference. Well, no, I mean, it's in, it's inconsequential. I mean, if you want to argue about how many different possible worldviews there are, I'll yes, argue that there are infinitely many, limited, but it doesn't matter. It does matter because there's a limited number of starting points, and the starting points are... In he doesn't understand that the reason you're saying it doesn't matter is because the claim He's that there's a limited number all, of... Right? Whether it's... Well, well and, and also the claim that there's a limited number of starting points, we that could be the case whether the amount is infinite or whether the amount is finite. Right. So you're, and mm. just like you said, yeah, it, regardless of which it is, we can grant we can grant that you're able to make this categorization and then you still, yes, have the task of showing they're all contradictory. So it's like, what? why are we quibbling over whether there's an infinite or a finite amount? You just say it's a fucking large, finite number. Intimately connect to, and oftentimes are, Preconditions of knowledge. Okay. There, if so, there are preconditions that we're debating over, there's not an infinite number of ways you can try to argue out of that. Sure. I mean, there's, there's two different things we're talking about at this point, right? We're talking about worldviews as a whole and the like starting points of, right. in, in people's worldviews. I could grant that there's a finite number of like possible starting points, whatever that means exactly, but still think there's an infinite number of possible worldviews. I mean, you world say views. whatever that means exactly. I've defined it exactly multiple times for <laughs> ethics. It's, it's really quite quite a vagary, so it's hilarious that he thinks he's defined it precisely. It's metaphysics, epistemology, there's a limited number of places that we can get. Let's take ethics, right? I mean, there's either sure. objective ethics or there aren't, right? Right. Or yeah, maybe you think it's both, right? So, that, so that's what a couple different places you could go with that. But see, this what's really frustrating about this is, so if there's, it's as if there's no like new sort of fundamental positions in in things like ethics over the years, right? Like, I mean, uh, yeah, you can ask a binary question: is there objective ethics or not? I mean, that is a binary question. So long as you both know what you mean by that, because there's different ways that you can understand what that you might take those options to be, but whatever. Um, but things like particularism, right? It's a relatively new introduction to the meta ethical landscape, right? It wasn't around 50 years ago, as far as I understand. Or at least if it was, it was hardly being discussed at all. And I think if you go back in the history of philosophy, it just doesn't exist at all. Or logical pluralism, for instance. That's that's really really new that idea. That people just weren't thinking about that at all a um, hundred years ago, or even about twenty years ago, really. Than when Beale and Restall's paper came out, two thousand one or something. But you know, it so it's not like there's just a fundamental 
list of binary questions and that's it for metaphysics people invent new ones right the same with ethics like it doesn't all right so it's so like straight jacketing uh philosophy into just these cookie cutter yes no questions like that's that's not how it works i mean i just reject that there are only a few ways you can do metaphysics <laughs> fuck that that's not true <laughs> yeah and, and jay has to assume that since his like worldview is all necessary things right um that it's like that's all the issues to philosophy that there will ever be right these are all the questions that are worth answering that exactly. your yeah it's yeah, just yeah. insane <laughs> yeah uh, sure. I mean, there's a lot of more questions okay, you can have you on those things, think, and you don't think that, that you most... might classify starting points. Okay, and I don't know why you're you're, are you, you're taking issue with whether that's a starting point. I mean, it doesn't matter no, if, I, you wanna, if you my... want to pick a different thing. Like, can you know ethical propositions? Right. Uh, it, yeah. Like, either of those could be saying. So I'm just saying, basic positions or maxims within a philosophical system. Right, my point there was just there was, it's a little bit vague about what you're including as a starting point, even if you're talking about ethics, epistemology, and metaphysics, whatever. Well, I, I mean, mean, you want more examples? Uh, but, I mean, I gave you, you said it's, no, <laughs> it's the last thing we need is more examples. Is more examples. <laughs> yeah, this right. was just a mistake. I shouldn't have even asked this. Positions fall into from the outset. Yeah, there's, it's, not it's, a lot of there's not a lot of options for people to go there. Like, if you're a materialist, right. uh, so I, I do have one criticism for you, Troy, which I was yeah. saying in, in text over and over again, which is like, when you're dealing with someone like this, like, you just have to be like, look, just give me an argument whose conclusion is every other worldview is contradictory. Okay, that's what I need from you. What are the premises? Yeah, that's uh, fair. Yeah. I mean, maybe that would have... Just, he's just going to try and take every opportunity to ramble and about... A tangential things at best i mean right yeah. it's like there's a is there a finite or an infinite amount of world views like i don't have to refute them one by one if i can go by category like blah 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 it's like look just fuck all that like just what is the actual argument that every other world view is contrary to? do you have it yes or no you're you pretty much even uh monism sometimes there are materialists that believe that there are essences or higher level abstract entities and so that's mm -hmm. dualistic uh okay so the, uh, it's fine enough that your clarification on starting points is, is good enough right because it, it's more or less like irrelevant to the point i'm trying to make uh it's your claim right that um no it's not irrelevant the other you're, like, you're, you're just, arguing like okay. this is a foundationalist this, this is the other thing about jay you can never say that he said something irrelevant off topic but anything like that will be met with an interruption <laughs> Every every single time, absolutely. Type of argument, but also big big props to you for throughout this whole thing. You don't leave this point, even though I could I could make that criticism of there's a more like direct way to do it, like force him to give an argument for it. It's like you still never move off of it, and most people eventually fall off of it. It's like if they don't get um you know derailed somewhere early on with one of his tangents you know they eventually will later they'll try pressing for the con showing him to show the yeah. contradiction for like a while and then eventually lose sight but you really don't let him go so that's although good. the mod does actually kind of push us off at one point yeah even even mods will try to come in and fuck with it it's that i think is a bad um it's a sign of bad modding but that's getting into I'm a whole not, other discussion i'm not i'm not sure if him giving like an argument would be that helpful because we could just give something like uh, the paradigm of preconditions or whatever is either the Eastern Orthodox Christianity view or some other paradigm there is no other paradigm therefore it is the Christian one and then you just stuck at the point of him having to justify uh, the second premise which he's trying to argue for but, but, but there'd be justify the first premise as well like why can there be multiple paradigms that could account for these things but ignoring that he just get back to him trying to justify the second premise. Which but is there, a there'd have justification of it would, could take the form of an argument. Right? I mean, it's just and yeah, there'd absolutely have to be provide another argument. But but that but that's the values. You finally moved past this stupid question of like, okay, what? How the fuck are you arguing for the contradiction? You actually, give some argument, and then you spot some problem with that, and then you've moved to okay, this is the next thing you have to do, right? Then at least we're not orbiting this same stupid point that he's not grasping for like an hour right 
so oh, venus i want to make sure i'm understanding you but like you're saying what's the point of asking him for an argument he'll just like give you some argument that requires a further like yeah, more I mean, work just, on his part yeah i could just he could just give like a destructive argument like the one i presented and then the, the problem was just stuck there were a remain of him having to give like the argument that every other worldview can ends up being contradictory or can't account for knowledge or, or whatever wait sorry so but it sounds that, like that's, the sub argument so, is just going to be the same sort of argument yeah but that's yeah, yeah if, that's if, what if, you're asking but but that, but then you'd have shown up wait so one one second so there's this initial argument it's like if every other worldview is contradictory then the christian worldview is true every other worldview is contradictory therefore the christian worldview is true so he asks troy asks what's what's the argument for p2 and then jay gives some argument for p2 how, how is that not advanced oh, the that, dialectic that would, that would advance i'm just saying you would specifically ask for like an argument for like p2 not just an yeah. argument, not just like some kind of syllogism for what he's saying oh i uh, sorry i'm being misunderstood so he's made he's made this argument already about you know if all other worldviews are contradictory then the christian worldviews too right he when you ask him why why christianity is like the impossibility of the contrary so i i take it the form there is just like it's just like modus ponens on if every other worldview is contradictory christianity is true so when i'm saying ask for an argument i'm, I'm talking about asking for an argument for p2 of that argument which is that every oh, other okay, worldview yeah, is contradictory yeah sure. yeah sure my bad then and yeah and if he gives an argument then the the dialectic's been advanced and if upon examining that argument a premise is fishy and you ask for an argument and then he restates that all other worldviews are contradictory then you've you've got a formal circle right it's like yeah. you have a, a clear circular yeah, argument might not have show formally. That, <laughs> but I mean, right well <laughs> I just took it that's it's a further thing i just look at that's what troy is doing now he's asking him for that argument but right. i assume you're just asking him to like form to present it in like formalized form instead of just babbling around yeah, I think I, but I, that's exactly what I'm saying. There's value to. I, I completely agree. Troy's asking him for that argument for P2. That's what this whole debate turns into. It's try, Troy trying to get that argument. So I don't know if you disagree, but no, I mean, no, no. I think yeah, they're. Yeah, yeah, like you should have like forced him to like you should have forced like, him to, like present it in some kind of a formalized version or something. And, and, and like even if you can't give something completely formal, at least give me like premises and a conclusion so I have a rough idea what you're talking about instead of just this like insane ramble right so we're just going off in the weeds every time you talk yeah i get what you mean there argument like why empirically demonstrate that every worldview is false my argument won't hold that only assumes yeah. that that foundationalism is true and i'm not i'm a presuppositionalist so i'm making a presuppositional argument i'm cutting through a lot of the bullshit and saying that none of that stuff ultimately matters if i can demonstrate something that's prior to empirical uh, is he cutting out, or is this just me? Uh, no, he's cutting out. Uh, Jay, you're kind of so cutting out a little bit. That out from under people? A three-tiered way. Oh, or... I actually moved it. Oh, shit. Was it around here? Yeah. Oh, no. We're at, like, 20-something uh, here. Oh, I, I, I got um, some... Let me, let me blow it up a little bit. Really... I was gonna say, what, what is his Prior point there about imperial... assuming a foundation? You're claiming... you're still trying... Yeah, that's what I'm gonna ask. Let's see. Let's see if we can hear it again. I'll, I'll try to find because it. Because everybody has a few basic places that they have. If you're talking about ethics, epistemology, and metaphysics, whatever. Well, I, I mean, mean, you want more examples? I mean, I gave you the way prior to empirical. Oh, this is it. Out of the bullshit. I'll try to go back. It's not any other more or less like irrelevant to the point I'm trying to make. Uh, it's your claim, right? That. Um, no, it's not irrelevant. Any other you're, you're, you're arguing like okay. this is a foundationalist type of argument. Like, mm -hmm. until I empirically demonstrate that every worldview is false, my argument won't hold. That only assumes well, that, that foundationalism is true, and I'm not. I'm a presuppositionalist, so I'm making a presupposition. What? Yeah, I don't see how there's an assumption of foundationalism there. I don't you understand could, you could... at what point he's possibly making that. Does, does anyone else have an idea? I don't, I don't know, but the only thing I got out of it is that you asking him to show every other worldview is contradictory apparently is somehow assuming foundationalism, but, but you know, who knows what he's saying, it just... That's a task he took on, I don't know, that's a claim he made. I don't well, it's, it's, just, it's just false that it would assume foundationalism. You could hold whatever theory of epistemic justification and still ask him, you know, what's the argument for P2? Right. 
Venus, were you trying to say something too? No, no, I was just trying to say something. Positional argument. I'm cutting through a lot of the bullshit and saying that none of that stuff ultimately matters if I can demonstrate something that's prior to empirical. Uh, is he cutting out, or is this just me? Uh, no, he's cutting out. Uh, Jay, you're kind of cutting out a little bit. That out from under people, then that. Your audio just cut out for a little bit. Might go out a little bit. Okay, yeah, he just lagged out. Um, he'll be back though. Hello, Jay. Is that better? No. Uh, no, you're still lagging a little bit. Um, Jay, Jay can you still hear us fine, though? Can you still hear Destroyer he... fine? Oh, did you just disconnect again? No, he's still here. Uh, I just want to make sure that you don't... Yes, I give can your... hear. I'm just waiting... Okay. I'm waiting until I get past this point okay. in, the tr in the road. Where it, you Maybe know, give me a, a minute to kind of clarify what yeah, criticism you want, I'm making. Yeah, if you want to clarify your position, and maybe my connection will get better. Yeah, so you made the claim earlier that your the way you demonstrate your conclusion that the Christian God is the necessary precondition for these uh, what you call transcendental categories, is by the impossibility of the contract, which is just to say that these other, any other worldview, or which doesn't include the Christian God or the Orthodox Christian God as a precondition for these things, um, is absurd, at least to a contradiction. It's incoherent. And um, what I've been asking is a demonstration of that claim, right? How do you get from uh, how do you get to the conclusion that for any other worldview um, that it leads to a contradiction? Because that's your claim, and if and then you started talking about um, well, all these other worldviews have a certain number of limited starting points, right? Um, I could agree with that, um, but if that's going to demonstrate your claim, you'd have to say something like this: um, Orthodox Christianity has a particular response to those starting points, which are unique to Orthodox Christianity, and every other response on those starting points leads to contradiction. You could do something like that, but, and if that's, that's your no approach, I'm gonna no be looking for the argument. argument dude. That's no different than a transcendental argument. Right, but then make the argument, right? I mean, you have to demonstrate the claim. Yeah, I am demonstrating the claim by pointing out that we don't have fundamental contradictions that destroy the possibility of knowledge the other worldviews have contradictory claims. That's no, that's the claim. Yeah. It's not. That's not the arc. Like that's what we're asking you to prove. We're just reiterating it. Right. Great. So um, the premise that the other worldviews, and remember that I assume you mean all non-Orthodox Christian worldviews. Correct. Uh, entail the <laughs> impossibility of, of knowledge or something like that. Correct. Okay. So how do we show that that's the case? Because they have fundamental flaws at the beginning of their positions that destroy the possibility of knowledge. <laughs> it's so it's like he's restate, restating the same claim in different words, slightly different words. Yeah, it's like he said, two is the only even prime. And you go, okay, great. What's the proof for that? And he goes, well, all the other ones are odd. It's like, no, that's the <laughs> claim again. <laughs> I want a proof for it. Like, what? You can't give an account of things they use. That is the argument. Do you not understand that that is an argument? Well, it's uh, claims, which it is an argument, right? <laughs> There's premises and conclusion. But I'm okay. I'm, so, do you deny that? I'm doubting the premises themselves. Do you deny that transcendental arguments are valid forms of argumentation? Well, of course they are. They're valid. Okay, then, then you shouldn't object to the argument because you're, it's a valid form. Of <laughs> Wait, hang on, but you can argument. object to the premises of a valid argument. One of your premises is, was that all other worldviews um, okay, so entail the impossibility of knowledge. But that's not my claim, right? Your claim is that all other no, worldviews... It is a claim because what, what worldview debates and uh, transcendental argumentation is about is about worldviews. So Worldview okay. debates. This is just goalpost moving. Yeah, now it's, now it's a shift, right? It's just... Yeah. He's not saying now the rules are, are different worldview debate means you have to um one-on-one -on -one, like 
in a car park having a bare knuckle box fight two people basically i've just decided that's what the rules are now and it's like why why should it be that he's made a claim you asked him to justify it and he's saying okay well, actually what we're going to do is have a fight it's just ridiculous right if you remember earlier on he said when he said like well i'm not just making this like transcendental argument i'm also making this argument that you know uh in a head-to-head -head match so to speak um my world becomes out on top and so and i mentioned like i mean i guess that's another argument you could make um but if you have this first argument um, that shows that all the other world beats are contradictory and yours isn't, then, I mean, why bother with the other head-to-head? -head? Just show this yeah. argument and you're good to go. Right? Exactly. Well, it's, it's, I it's think the up. cycle. Sorry, go for it. Well, look, if you have a proof that two is the only even prime, then you don't need to also say, well, part of my argument, you know, in mathematical arguments is one person champions one number and another person champions another and we work out whether either of them are even primes or something that's not what you do if you've already got the argument that proves that two is the only even prime you just no point combining you know, having one-on-one -on -one fights between numbers to see which is best or something that's completely pointless yeah so i don't know i i think that i could only speculate but like i would assume the psychological reason is that he thinks he can do better in that context i mean i, th I think that he wants yeah. to get into this whole like like well how do you answer this kind of question i got an answer for it it's god well what about this kind of question right yeah well, he's right. clearly run out of things to say I, I can't defend this argument on this at this level anymore it's like he gives two arguments and you ask him to justify the first one and he just goes to the second one and he's like give me give me a give me a paradigm that can mm. go head to head against mine well i'm comparing worldview to your worldview which you haven't said what your worldview is yet <laughs> because you're not making an argument you're just trying to hypothetically find a flaw in the in my position <laughs> i but... love obvious obvious comment to that lol all in capital letters j trying to shift the bop it's mm -hmm. funny because this is the, the comment that was just made by everyone in this chat but you know there he is making it as well. Second, why is my worldview relevant to your claim that all yeah, of the world's views world view don't... Because it's a worldview debates question. It's my paradigm <laughs> versus your paradigm. And now you're trying to switch it into classical foundationalism. Yeah, I'm trying to switch as it. As yeah. if it's just a question of going through the different positions one by one. No. Now, if you want... So, okay. No, can, you you want give an account, to... can you give an account for the things... He's really forcing it, eh? At the beginning of the debate? Uh, sure. I mean, I can talk about some of my views you on give this. An I remember, I remember when I heard you say that, I feared so much. I was like, is he going to fucking fall into Jay's bullshit? But you don't. Well, that's, we can what do that. that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to do. That's no, what this debate is about, dude. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. So we can get into that, but that's not what the debate was about. And no, it's not, so wouldn't demonstrate I'm, your I'm claim. I'm getting ahead of you even because if I'm heading you, you off to, my view. listen, I'm heading you off to explain that for your argument to work, what you're doing, mm -hmm. you're going to need to prove classical foundationalism. That's what you're going to have what? to do. So yeah, all I, I have to do what? is go back to pointing out the five major <laughs> self-contradictions of a classical empiricist type of worldview. Well, I don't really it's consider myself a foundationist. not really in point. the traditional sense, okay, but, but that's not where your relevant. argument to, It is because you're not understanding paradigms. You're trying to trap me on. No, I basically, do. you're saying that there aren't paradigm level questions that, that prove and disprove paradigms. That's what you're having to say. You're not explicitly saying that, but for your argument... When did you say anything like that? You were remotely like Sure. That. So, what, but your argument was, or your claim was, all other worldviews uh, lead to a contradiction, or at least Correct. are incompatible with, with knowledge. They're, they destroy the possibilities of knowledge. That's different. Right, and when I asked you for um, a demonstration... See, see, Jay isn't even adept enough to to capitalize on this, but you're almost letting you're giving him a little bit of weasel room there when it's like destroy the possibility of knowledge versus entail a contradiction, right? Because the the no, know, contradiction right? contradiction one is brutaler. Like that's a more hilarious thing to try right. to claim. Because the world you could uh, not have <laughs> be consistent with any knowledge yet, not be contradictory, right? And right. it seems so, like he was only he was making the stronger claim at the beginning. He he doesn't even notice that he has a weasel opportunity to shift the claim there when you're doing that. But yeah, optimally, I would think you probably wouldn't even want to do that. Just like straight up force him on that first claim about the contradiction. 
demonstration of that, at that point you're saying, okay, what's your example Do you not understand the that world? the demonstration is the multiple examples I've already given, and then you turn around and say, well, give me an example. <laughs> give me a demonstration. No, 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 no. no. All the examples of demonstration. Yeah, it's showing an example of something shows that it's the case for every worldview. It's like, what the fuck are you talking about? This is how mathematical induction works, right? I mean, you just show a couple examples here or there, and QED. Yeah, yeah that's how you know, I had I had to learn a little bit about mathematical induction to start chugging away at this book on non-classical logic. And when Doorman showed me mathematical induction, he just uh, he just pointed me to this little instance in the JDebate. Enough to rule out all other worldviews. Which is just what your claim is. So because consider this, all, right? Because all other worldviews are Hang limited on. in their starting points, and if they start with basic contradictions, and they all do, I've the, the argument. Okay. There's the claim. You're saying that they all do. That's the right. question, the premise that I'm not convinced of. How do you so, show that so, all of the other worldviews start with contradictions? Because there's a limit. And it's not going to be enough. Well, there's a finite so, amount. There's a limited number of places that any possible worldview can go. Don't you understand that? I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Um, can I just, if I could just interject really quick, I think you guys at this point are at an impasse on this issue. I, I think, um, when it I, I get the whole chat raging at the mod to shut up here. Like, honestly, mods can be so fucking annoying. It's like, you have them completely in a corner, and mods have these, like, weird principles in their head a lot of the time. Like, giving, like you know, making sure everyone just feels comfortable or, like, making sure there's equal speaking time or that the topic, like, moves along or something. And it's like, why the fuck do those things matter? Like, what matters is, like, more something, like, that the point gets, like, properly hashed out. So I, I just was enraged by that mod coming in there because you had him in such a good uh, good corner. It comes to this, I think what Jay's obviously, for people who might not understand, Jay's saying basically only Orthodox Christianity can make sense of reality um, and can actually ground these categories of our experience that are needed. And Detroyer is saying that there's a burden of proof for that claim that Jay can't Correct. meet. And, Jay, what, and what Jay is saying is that we can sort of, uh, although there's different numerators, there's sort of a common denominator, right? Yes. Th Would that be only, a proper characterization? Yes. It doesn't matter what your different worldview is, how many you can choose all, choose, pick 32 different flavors, it doesn't matter. Because all I have to do is ask you the basic questions of epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics, and you're going to destroy yourself. So, okay. Um, and that's why you won't present your war, war, your own worldview. Hang on. I can present because some I will my easily view. dissect your worldview. Uh, we can do that. We will do that in well, a few that, minutes. That's what you don't want that's to do. Not you don't point. actually have a challenge. No, I don't mind. Then no, let's do Hang that. on. We will do that, but that's not, <laughs> this is not the point of the debate. So it let me, the let's be the very debate. clear. The debate, the, the debate yeah. is, no, the debate no, is the comparison it, of paradigms. You're going to have to prove that there aren't limited numbers of paradigms. No. We're so not back to not suppose that I present some of my views on these, these matters and you demonstrate some problem in my view. And it's really okay. convincing, right? You, you don't understand that really it's some not just some problem. You don't understand the difference between a paradigm level problem and just no, I do, right? conundrum. See, at this point, it's just it's just, just mind numbing. I'm gonna have to. It's like, it it seems to me like Jay's made a really stupid claim. Like he's gone, there are no Scottish women, right? And you go, <laughs> what the hell? And then he goes, well, where are you from? And then you're like, what, why is that relevant? To can you justify the claim? It doesn't matter where I'm from, right? Like, so what if I was even if I was a that me right like i mean you have to justify your claim um uh, and later on when we get into the ad hoc thing um it's like he said there's no scottish women and then you go well what about nicola sturgeon first minister of scotland she's a scottish woman and then he's gone oh that's ad hoc and it's like how could it be ad hoc <laughs> yes yeah, it's it's just just a yeah, you said there's no X is a Y, and I just said, what about this X? It looks like it's Y. It can't be ad hoc to do that. Um, oh my god, it, it. I think it's a good place to bow out for me. But um, I didn't realize we were only 37 minutes in. I thought, I thought we were mm -hmm. getting close. <laughs> Two and a half hours ahead. to get 37 okay. minutes. Run away. <laughs> 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 well, I was getting parent horribly, so, you know, as, as is my way, I'm going to scurry off now and then have a little cry on my own. Well, thanks, for, we just... thanks for joining us for the conversation. Uh, Alex. All good. Yeah.
we enjoyed having you. Cool. Should okay. we just uh, should we just call it there, or what are you guys saying? Um, if you really want me to keep I going, so, I'm indifferent. If yeah. someone really wants to continue, um... no, that's that's good. This was this was good. I think people will enjoy this review. And of course, you know, Jay, oh. if you ever want to defend your position, I'm waiting. It doesn't get any better, does it? It just keeps repeating the same thing, right? Yes. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I mean, it, it gets a little um, interesting, I guess, when he's on the ad hoc thing, but um, especially when he comes back later. But it's not, in terms of content, there's really nothing that doesn't get any better. Well, it's good, uh, good going through this with you guys. So, uh, yeah, thanks for participating. Have a good one, eh? Yeah, this was fun, Tucker. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's that's